call to order the Tuesday, February 14, 2023, <coughs> Town Council Committee of the Whole to order at 631. All counselors are present with the exception of Councilor Parker and Councilor Westervelt. I do expect Councilor Westervelt to be here via Zoom at some point shortly. Okay, thank you. Calendar and communications, Councilor Bumgarten. Uh, yes, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, just a, a little bit of an update as far as uh, this week goes. Um, uh, received no shortage of uh, communications from residents uh, regarding um, both council and legislative business. Um, also attended an, a really incredible, uh, uh, the second annual Black History Month celebration uh, over in uh, downtown Mystic held at the Union Baptist Church. Um, attended and participated, um, attended and participated in the event uh, with uh, Councilors uh, Bordelon, uh, Councilors, uh, Council Bordelon, Councilor Jones, as well as Mayor Melendez. Um, we all um, provided uh, or uh, brought uh, poems um, written by um, uh, f uh, black poets and uh, folks from um, um, just some um, black individuals uh, in our uh, body of uh, literature in American history. And um, I was just really blown away by the participation and uh, especially from our youth, uh, many children from um, Isaac School um, presented as well. Um, and uh, just want to thank the Chamber of Commerce <coughs> as well as the um, New Ink Mystic uh, Library for uh, hosting a really incredible event. Um, uh, additionally, um, I would like to share um, some news with the community um, and this council. Um, that tonight will be uh, my last meeting as a, a counselor uh, of this body, um, a body I've been uh, very proud to have served on for the last um, almost five years. Um, it is a very much a bittersweet evening, um, just reflecting in the last couple of days on uh, the work we've done over the years uh, together um, on so many fronts. Um, and so um, with that, um, just wanna make a note to the community uh, thank you again for uh, allowing me to serve uh, this community and the council um, for over uh, three terms now. And just uh, want to take the opportunity to talk about um, the, the, really those the last four years. Um, you know, had the honor and privilege to serve an amazing town, um, a community that has so much history. Um, so, you know, even walking around going to some of our state parks such as you know fort griswold you're just blown away at how far back our local history goes and to have had the honor to represent this community um, on the council uh, at a really um i think uh, un uh, just an unparalleled time if you will you know at a time where we've faced a global pandemic uh, at a time when there is uh, so much strife in, in our world um, in some ways, Groton is a microcosm of some of the, uh, you know, of some of the issues that we've seen at the national level. You know, we're talking about uh, ensuring, you know, that our, uh, you know, we live in a community that doesn't have food insecurity. Making sure that uh, we live in a community that has uh, equitable housing and, and safe housing for all. Uh, making sure that we live in a community that invests in our our youth and our uh, youth activities and sports. And there's, um, we, we've had so many different conversations about uh, so many critical issues. And, um, you know, for one, uh, just for starters, even dating back to 2018, first getting on the council, um, you know, so proud of the work we did on plastics reduction, um, really being a leader at the state level. Um, you know, and there are some municipalities that have replicated their plastics reduction ordinances after our community. And um, I think that is something to be proud of. Um, you know, we've also um, been one of the very, I think the first community to voluntarily um, have bilingual ballots. Um, most communities that do have them are, are uh, mandated to, and in Groton we chose to, and do wanna give um, a big shout out to my sister in service uh, Councilor Bordelon uh, for helping lead that effort as well. Uh, we also embarked on the largest school construction project 
in our town history. Um, and uh, credit to uh, so many of those on the council who at the time that happened, Councilor Franco, Councilor Melendez, Councilor um, Bordelon working through some issues uh, that um, in some days we had, oh, and of course, my uh, seatmate to the left, um, uh, Councilor Parker, um, there were many days we thought that project, uh, unfortunately, uh, would uh, not see the light of day because of um, some glitches, if you will, uh, and we're able to turn things around. And as a result, um, so many school children are now being educated uh, in amazing uh, new school buildings and really proud of that. And also uh, built a financing plan to ensure that um, taxpayers would not have to uh, shoulder um, significant costs down the road by virtue of getting a, sh a good uh, state reimbursement. Um, the largest property acquisition in my lifetime, uh, Wolfbrook property, uh, happened. Uh, we closed the deal last month. Uh, that, as you know, uh, Councilor Franco, Councilor Bordelon, Councilor Melendez, uh, something that we've discussed for years now, um, finally getting over the her finish line, uh, took a lot of moving parts, um, and um, uh, we were able to identify and find consensus on that. Um, and um, most, I think, um, most importantly, uh, shining a light on the inequities uh, in our housing uh, supply and our um, some of the uh, housing issues we've seen in Groton in particular with Branford Manor. Uh, for years, um, the issues in Branford Manor um, really went unabated. Uh, the the um, solutions um, were far and few between and finally we shone a light on that and um, as a council came together and started taking action. There still is so much work uh, to be done as we've heard at so many public comments but um, we started that process and that was critical and giving hope to those residents that somebody out there was listening and uh, to me there's just nothing uh, that compares to that and you know certainly you know our council um, over the years we've agreed on some things and not always agreed on some things whether you know um, very proud, for example, of the knowing school property. Um, what we ended up doing with that, um, ensuring that it was uh, protected in perpetuity for uh, the community. Um, but nonetheless, even if there were some internal disagreements within the council, we still um, listened to the community, and I think the community was proud of our decisions. I think same goes for what also what was done with data centers. Um, and um, lastly, um, you know, last week we worked on complete streets. Um, finally getting a committee uh, together and really hope that this council um, prioritizes that, that work um, from here on out. So again, I'm very proud of, of uh, these accomplishments. These are not my com accomplishments. These are the uh, collective work of each and every one of us on this body. Um, just kind of looking across this, this table, um, you know, I know some of us um, have dealt with a lot of our own uh, personal issues over, over the, the uh, years and, and, and sometimes, uh, you know, the, these meetings uh, can go <laughs> get very lengthy and get very emotional. Um, but at the end of the day, just know that each and of us, and I, I, don't, um, I don't say this lightly, uh, even if we do not always agree, uh, I don't question uh, any single counselor uh, on this uh, body as far as how much they love this community. I know each and every one on this council deeply loves this community. Um, and lastly, I do want to acknowledge some of my uh, elder colleagues uh, who are not here. Uh, certainly, uh, former Mayor Rita Schmidt, who I had the privilege of serving with, uh, the late uh, Councillor Joseph Perry, uh, God bless his heart and his soul, um, and certainly uh, Councillor Aubrey. We mourn her uh, loss as well um, this week and, and the loss of Joan. Um, but. I deeply admire each and every one of you again, and I hope that moving forward, um, we can continue working together. Um, won't be going too far. We'll continue serving as your state representative, um, but just know the door is always open. And um, I thank each and every one of you for, for sharing uh, this opportunity and wish you nothing but the best and hope that each of you work together in good faith. Won't always agree on the issues, but um, make our community proud, and I'm here to support uh, this body in any way I can as your state representative. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Franco. Uh, thank you, I don't have anything to report, but I wish you well on your endeavors up at the state. Thank you, and it's uh, 
it has been ups and downs with uh, us on this council. Um, but <coughs> I thank you for your service to our community. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Jones. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I also echo, uh, thank you, <coughs> Councilor Baumgartner. Uh, thank you for the service that you've done for the community and um, best of luck up in the, the state. And uh, we'll be looking forward to all the good things that you're gonna be doing up there. So um, I also attended the, and I would echo the same thing that um, Councilman Baumgartner said today, it was an outstanding Black History Month event at the Union Baptist Church. Uh, Councilor Parker was also there too. Uh, a big thank you to the Mystic uh, Chamber of Commerce and um, the Union Baptist Church. And there are other sponsors too for putting on a fantastic event. Uh, last year we did it in the freezing cold standing in, the, in a park in Mystic. Um, uh, Mayor Melendez was there and, and Councilor Parker was there. Um, last year and this year too. And this year I think we went, it was just a great experience. Um, lots of great stuff. Um, later on, Councilor Parker, Mayor Melendez and uh, Representative Jacoma and I all did the Super Bowl at Thrive 55. And um, it was incredibly well attended with a huge rush of people coming in to get soup. And uh, a big thank you to all the 12 restaurants who um, contributed soup to the event. I, I see uh, Director Barry is in the audience here, and a huge um, uh, congratulations to a really, really well attended event. Um, I also this weekend did the a tour of the Venture Smith um, property. It was mentioned on uh, uh, February 1st when we did the Black History Month, but I was able to tour the, the Venture Smith property um, this Sunday uh, with the Stonington Historical Society and the NAACP, and uh, that was a, a pretty interesting, very, very interesting experience to see. Um, all those things so um, and then I also received all the emails and things so thank you Councilor McBride thank you I also want to thank Councilor Bogarner for his efforts uh, he's done a tremendous job so thank you for your time and best of luck in your future pursuits so best of luck um, also wanted to indicate that I have participated in FOI request in Hartford uh, there's a case against uh, the personnel and appointments committee and the town council and the Groton town so I participated in that case um, a few weeks ago. Also received normal correspondence regarding uh, different topics that everybody else has mentioned. In addition, uh, had numerous discussions on the Board of Ed budget, some discussions on the non-lapsing fund, and other discussions on storm order authority. Also had the, attended the personal appointments meeting uh, last week, and did want to let everyone know that the property reuse committee that was originally scheduled for tomorrow needs to be postponed. I'll be working with the committee uh, to schedule a date, hopefully on the 22nd, to see if uh, they could be in attendance. I have a, I had something uh, out of state that I, I had to have to be at tomorrow, uh, or the other side of the state, and I tried to ask if there was a quorum, and I couldn't get a quorum for the other individuals uh, to still hold that meeting, so I had to reschedule it. So that's all I had to report. Thank you. Council Uh <clears throat> Yes, thank you. Uh, first, I just wanted to thank uh, Councilor Bumgardner for his uh, hard work and dedication to Groton. Again, um, it's been a pleasure working with you, as already stated. You've done wonderful things, and I've enjoyed my time working with you, walking with you, knocking doors, campaigning, and uh, you know all your great energy and effort to the community, to the, to the party in Groton, as well as the community at large. You're very passionate. You get back to folks. You're out there. You're on the ground and listening. Um, definitely feels like a loss for me today on Valentine's Day having you leave. Uh, <laughs> You've been a tried and true friend of mine, a trusted friend of mine, and a loyal friend throughout everything. So um, the community is not losing you. You're moving up to the state, but you know, uh, please, you know, stay. Uh, I know you'll be involved as, as best you can down here. And uh, thank you, thank you, thank you for all you all that you've done and your service. And uh, I definitely will miss you on Tuesday nights. So. Um, as it was already stated, uh, I also do, did it also attend the Black History Month celebration put on by the chamber, by um, you know headed uh, by the, the chamber with uh, Mr. Flax, as well as uh, as it was stated, some sponsors and the Union Baptist Church, as well as the Noink, uh, the Noink Mystic Library. Uh, it was heavily attended. It was uh, great great opportunity to speak. I enjoyed having an opportunity along with the fellow counselors, as stated, Bumgardner, Jones, Parker and uh, Melendez, uh, who also spoke. Um, it was the second annual. It was really exciting because Rotten also held their second annual as stated on February 1st. And I remember last year, Mr. Flax reaching out to me to get some contacts. Um, Booker, Kevin Booker uh, kind of ran this uh, program for the chamber. 
And uh, he had run the one here or had spoke at the first one that I had did. And uh, I know when Mr. Flax reached out, I said, I got a person for you, Booker will be your guy. Mm -hmm. And wow, look what it's done. Look how, how much it's grown. And I think it's, you know, it only get better from here. So um, it's really, really exciting. Um, with that, continuing with the celebrations, there also will be a, um, I just want to pull it up here. There will be a uh, Martin Luther King celebration at St. Mark's Episcopal Church on Pearl Street on uh, Saturday, the 25th of February at 4 p.m. Um, it's a free uh, concert and lecture about gospel music. Um, the lady um, that's running it with her singers is called Lisa Clayton. Um, if you're familiar with the Martin Luther King Jr. Scholarship uh, celebration and fundraiser they did at Ledger High School um, for Martin Luther King's birthday, she also was there with her singers. Um, we will be collecting, um, it, again, it's free, but they are taking donations um, for the Dr. Martin Luther King uh, Jr. Trust Fund, um, the, which supports local uh, scholarships in New London County for uh, minority students. Um, so it's a great opportunity to give to the community during Black History Month and support our students, as well as, you know, a little history and knowledge and such that will be happening at um, St. Mark's Episcopal Church, which once again is Saturday at 4 p.m. Everybody's invited. There's, it's not a speaker forum. It's mainly gonna be like a sit and listen kind of thing. So I'm very excited. I have been working with the church and collaborating with them and helping them um, together with their anti-racism group that they have in that church that are trying to bring in more cultural uh, events. So very exciting. I also was contacted by several residents about the old mystic flag that was raised there on February 1st. A uh, couple emails, a couple phone calls, the flag was missing. Um, and on Sunday, um, I did email, uh, well actually, Mr. Burt did call me about, about it and stated that he had been in contact with folks in the community as of Friday with concerns of the flag, um, but never once did they say they were taking it down. Um, then I proceeded to get another call back from Mr. Burt, and I want to thank him. Um, like I said, there was three concerned citizens in the area. Uh, I did go down there to see, you know, what was going on first, you know, making sure, yep, in fact, the flag was not there. Um, and Mr. Burke did say, uh, the town manager, that they were returning the flag. Uh, Mr. Richards from the fire department did return the flag and put it back up. Uh, then there was some more dialogue and email that, you know, it's a veteran memorial, is it constitutional, is it right, can it be there? And I guess that what I heard is that there were some veterans that complained about having it. Um, again, I did some research as well. The town manager sent all the council, there was nothing and the town manager stated if there was a violation, then send it in writing. Uh, but you know, please leave the flag alone until further notice. As of now, there's been nothing. Um, I also did reach out to some local, as my son is an active member. Um, at our event on the first, we had seven Navy sub uh, school uh, instructors and students here who rose the flag and actually salute the flag while it went up. Um, so I can't understand why it would be a veterans. There are black veterans that that flag would represent and very proudly. Look at Fort Griswold, look at the, you know, the air, the, the, the classic uh, events around the country. So I'm happy to see the flag is back up and I wanted to thank uh, the town manager um, for his efforts uh, calling on a Sunday saying, oh, I just, I'm gonna make sure that flag gets back. So thank you, John. Um, I also received um, an e email from Joseph uh, Splane, Spin uh, Splain of Mystic about Allen Street, asking about the access road or driveway that was going in there. Uh, I did send an email to John, and he did tonight before coming send a correspondence uh, back about that, so I will read that and understand that further. Um, it was spoken under public comment about the co-op uh, down at the Oyster thing in, in Noank. I happen to be in Noank. I go there frequently to walk with friends that live it throughout Noank, and I stopped in not to address the situation, because that's not for me to get involved with as far as who and what area, but to kind of understand how the co-op operates um, was very interesting. Um, the folks that spoke the other night under public comment were not there during that time. I did get to witness the other co-op, and I did some more research and realized that that building was donated um, back, Yukon used to own it back, and I remember back in 99, I think it was, um, a lot of people rising up and not wanting uh, condos to go there, and there's a partnership where the town, to my understanding, um, owns it uh, as long as it stays a co-op. 
Uh, so it's really interesting, very enlightening to kind of go down and understand. I've been digging to understand how that co-op works and it's an asset to have um, in our community. Um, I think that was all I received. Oh, uh, the Mystic, uh, the Mystic, the Fitch Falcon Music Booster is holding a fundraiser on the 24th of February. It's uh, a cover band called, you know, uh, Reenacting Beatles. They're selling tickets. It's their annual fundraiser. They usually invite a, uh, a band that comes that uh, represents or has a background in a certain genre or, or style of music. All proceeds support um, the Fitch Falcon Music Booster. Um, if you look for, if you want information, it is up on the web website. I don't have the flyer in front of me, um, but it is up there. I think it's even on my page as well. So if you're considering a fun night out, the band and the chorus usually participate with one of the pieces that they're doing. So it's a nice community event and a good way to uh, reach out and support. Um, I also did receive that, as stated by Councillor McBride, uh, there was not a quorum. Um, at, did, did receive email stating that could any other councillors run it? I agreed to run it at that, that meeting, but we did not have a quorum to keep the meeting uh, going. So we will postpone until next week, which is understandable. Um, I think those are all my correspondence. Oh, I did send out um, a rules committee request regarding my uh, ask for, um, you know, after, you know, going to the state for up there for bills, they do a nice courtesy thing where they say, you have 30, second left, 30, 30 seconds left, can you please summarize and wrap up? It's a nice way of saying your time has ended. Again, not saying anyone's done anything wrong, but since we're newly keeping time over the last couple of years, I sent the referral as a way of kind of respecting the folks online. I know if you're online as a counselor, you can't see the time. And if you're speaking from online, you can't see the time. So I did send that referral to the rules committee. Um, also as well as a referral, again, under the new rules, I need two other counselors. Is that, is that correct, uh, Juan? That's correct. All right. Two other counselors besides myself to get a referral through. And that referral was to relook at our um, our referral with the uh, Bradford Manor in um, you know putting them in default. Um, maybe there should be some better language where there's more protections of the community and the residents there. So I just, again, doesn't mean it's going to change, but hoping to get the support of the counselors to at least get it on the agenda. agenda to discuss because we are getting tons of emails and calls and people going to the city meeting as well as the town to discuss their concerns uh, with Brantford and not feeling that their voices are being heard and that the work and repairs are moving as smoothly as it may appear on paper. So I'm hoping to get the support of that referral. Thank you. Council Westerville. We can't hear you, and you're unmuted. Council Westfold, yeah, we can't hear you. I might not be able to hear you. Oh. Manager Burke, can you speak to see if it's, if it's on our end? You can hear us. No, we no. can't hear you. Nope. Just one second. Council Westfall, could you try to speak? Yes, sir. Okay, we can hear you. Thank you. Um, sure. Is that better? Yes. Excellent. 
So I received uh, most of the same emails that everyone else did. Um, and thank you very much to the public for that. Um, I'd like to also thank Councillor Bumgarner. He's been he's been a big help to me. He's taught me a few things. Um, he's been a sounding board as I've uh, you know just this first time being on the town council, and I appreciate everything that you've done to help me um, and explaining some of the things that were going on. So I really appreciate that, and I wish you absolutely the best of luck in your future endeavors. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kasiri. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. I received various communications regarding the plans for the River Road driveway, the Mystic Parking Public input, sorry, input flyer for next Tuesday, the 21st at Union Baptist Church from 5 to 6, parking meters in downtown, uh, Mystic Ed Center foyer requests, emails regarding last week's meeting, um, the town attorneys, flag protocol, Board of Ed projected enrollment numbers, uh, praising email regarding our amazing Groton Public Library, uh, NIP and opioid funds, several referrals, information <coughs> about a subdivision off of Allen Street, and a thank you from the ARC of Eastern Connecticut. And I would also like to wish Councilor Bumgardner well, and I hope you do great things for Groton. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I had the privilege to volunteer at the Super Bowl um, this Saturday. It's always one of my favorite events uh, just to get to sample a lot of the different uh, restaurants in our community. This year was especially well, well attended. So um, just also want to thank Councilor Jones, Councilor Parker, um, and Representative Jacome for also volunteering. Um, and shout out to Kathy Williams from, from our uh, Thrive 55, who always does such a good job uh, putting that event together. Um, as others had stated, I had the privilege to um, speak at the Black History Month uh, celebration. It was hosted graciously, um, beautiful venue, the Union Baptist Church in downtown Mystic. Um, uh, Kevin Booker Jr. did an amazing job hosting, um, and there was just many inspirational speeches given, um, lots of great black literature read. Uh, my favorite quote that, that stood out for me actually came from the, the Isaac School uh, students, and they quoted Ruby Bridges saying, uh, racism is a grown-up disease and, and we need to stop using our children to spread it. So that was, uh, that was a very inspiring event to me. I look forward to attending next year. Um, I'm sure it will be even bigger and better. Uh, finally, I just want to uh, thank Councilor Bumgardner. Uh, for his long service to this town. As everyone knows, your service is not over. It's simply just going to be um, in a different form. And uh, I think you'll, you'll, you'll do great there. You'll do great things for Groton. Um, you know, if you need anything from me, um, you know, just reach out. And I, I, know, I know the phone's open this, the, the, uh, the other way, too. So, so um, just good luck. Uh, I know you don't need it, but still, I want to wish you good luck and, um, you know, go do, go do great things. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mayor, if I can indulge for sure. once more. I um, want to thank each and every one of you for your kind words. Um, I'd be remiss if I uh, didn't acknowledge um, uh, Manager Burt as well. Um, throughout my entire time on the council, he uh, has served as our town manager. Um, in fact, I think when we um, took over, uh, you know, many of us joined the council, he had uh, just started as our town manager. I want to thank him for his continued service to our community. Also, uh, former mayor uh, Patrice Granitowski, um, my uh, predecessor in the house, uh, Joe Dela Cruz, who, who is in the, the building as well. Um, and uh, most importantly, uh, the two most important women in my life, uh, my mother, uh, Liz, who um, has um, supported me in more ways than none uh, in my uh, constant pursuits in politics, if you will. Um, and I, I could not have done this without her. And um, most importantly, my wife, uh, Kayla Riasco, who uh, is my constant sounding board, uh, my support. And um, I would not be the, the man I am with, without her. So uh, she, uh, she is certainly my better half. And uh, thank you for putting up with me all these years on, on the council. Um, but um, thank you again. And um, look forward to continuing to working with each and every one of you. The door is always open. Councilor Yeah, thank you. Um, nicely said, uh, Councilor Bumgarner. 
Um, I just forgot to add that I did have correspondence with the superintendent and Sam Kirkpatrick. Um, there were some folks at the high school during fencing that were kind of, parents were sitting there wanting a, um, a bottle fill station. If you're familiar with where the two gyms are at the back side, which is the old side of the building, you have the two restrooms on the left when you come in and there's a water fountain in the middle. They did recently, if you remember back when the whole lead issue, they refitted things and put in some filtration and some bottle fill stations. There is one further down past the locker rooms, but where the doors close, you start to enter the main building and it's not necessarily as accessible to people coming out of the gyms. So um, I did send an email. It doesn't sound like it's something they have to vote on that, except from what Sam uh, sent back, said he'd be looking into it. He didn't see that it was really that big of a cost. So hopefully, um, if, if it is, they'll probably come back, but it looks as if they could try to put a, a water filtration station right outside those gyms. And um, a few parents had brought it up. And so that was a communication that I had sent forward. And, and hopefully it's something that will make a difference. Thank you. Thank you. On to the approval of minutes. I make a motion to approve the meeting minutes of January 17th special meeting and the January 24th regular meeting. So moved. Second, Jones. Moved by Melendez, seconded by Jones. Council Portalon. Uh, yeah, I just would like to make one amendment to the minutes. Um, under the section where it starts to state, uh, where we talked about the allocations for um, police, fire, EMS, there was talks where the numbers moved from three to 2,000. And it says discussion. Um, I just would like it to be added that, you know, I did state. Um, what page? It's, um, it does, it's kind of throughout the whole thing on that whole section. So it could be page five. It could be added anywhere, really. Um, but it under that section, it just to state that when we move the number and we decide to go $1,500 across the board, I think it's important to state there that at that point I had stated on the record that uh, I'm all for a number, but I think it should be equal for EMS, fire, and police, since they are all first responders and it's COVID relief money. Um, and so it, it just doesn't state that anywhere in here. So I just asked for that amendment to be added. Um, I went back and watched the meeting again to double verify. Um, it states certain things in here, and I know we do not want these to get too lengthy. Again, I encourage everyone, minutes don't really reflect the meetings. You really have to watch the meetings now because we did go to a shorter version, but it would make sense to how we got to that point. And I think it is important if we state other things that we uh, do state you know, uh, the important parts of that. And uh, one of the reasons and rationales for keeping it, since that was the only number we could agree on was the 15, was to make sure all had the same level. So that's my amendment. Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay. Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All in favor say aye. I just want to check, are we voting on the amended one or the one? Aye. Aye. No. No, we just, we always vote on the minutes as amended. Oh, so they're voting on as amended. That's what, that's what I'm asking. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Can you just say that when you, because I was confused and I didn't know we were doing two votes or not. I apologize. No, no. Thank you. We, we always do it this way. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Council West vote. Was that in favor? Yes, it was. Could okay. you hear me? Yes. Um, opposed? Abstentions? Carries unanimously. I'm abstaining. You're abstaining. Carries? I abstained too. I okay. So what do we have here? Six like in roll favor. Call vote. Roll call vote. I'm not hearing people leave and voting. Councilor Baumgartner, how do you vote? Aye. Councilor Franco? Abstain. Uh, Councilor Jones? Aye. Melendez is a yes. Councilor McBride? Abstain. Yes. That's Councilor Bordelon. Councilor Kassiri? Yes. Councilor Westervelt? voted yes six in favor zero opposed to abstaining Franco recording in yeah. progress Franco McBride so oh, no. passes. Mm -hmm. okay. are actually online to Bernardo and Sapi Kaswan the owner I think we just hooked up and hi there can, can you hear me okay yes 
Okay, hi. Uh, uh, I'd like to be able to share my screen. Can you allow me to do that? Council will stand in recess at 7.05. We just crossed our Yeah, it, we're doing it every week now. It always crosses. Just when I thought we were going to take any breaks today.
Council's back from recess at 716. On to new business, S uh, smoking ban in town parks. We have Director Barry as well as a representative from GASP, Carolyn Wilson. Thank you. Welcome, Director Barry. If you could just give some background. Hello? Test, test. Oh, there we go. Good evening, Mark Berry, Director of Parks and Recreation. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, uh, Groton Parks and Recreation has been with uh, gas for 15 plus years. We actually, I think we're one of the original, yes, so that's 24 20 years, years, 23, right. Um, so back in 2021, gas uh, presented a proposal to the Parks and Recreation Commission to expand uh, no sp smoking and vaping uh, to include all parks. Uh, currently, there is signage restricting smoking at playgrounds and athletic fields. Uh, the Parks and Recreation Commission supported the proposal as it met one of the pillars of service to the community, which is health and wellness. Um, and a referral was written and a letter of support was submitted to the council to uh, include no smoking in all public spaces. Uh, during council deliberations, there was concern about including all public spaces, uh, so at that time no action was taken. Uh, the referral before tonight's council is to ban smoking in town-owned parks and recreation uh, facilities and open space properties, excluding Shenacoset Golf Course. Um, as a steward of public health, uh, our goal is to maintain uh, a healthy, safe environment by reducing children's exposure to unhealthy behavior and secondhand smoke. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for uh, giving some attention to this topic. As uh, Mr. Barry said, this has been something that we've been interested in uh, for a while. Uh, I think the first time I came to a council meeting to talk about it was October of 2021. Uh, we introduced the idea uh, that was um, inspired by the um, the legalization of cannabis in Connecticut, which um, on the heels of that gave towns the ability to make decisions about where it could and couldn't be used. So many towns were starting to make decisions about that. Um, fast forward to November 30th of 2022, I submitted a um, a statement, if you will, um, about the history of advocacy in the area and some other supporting information uh, and some statistics and just some background information about uh, sound public health policy. Uh, one thing that has recently changed, um, sort of a surprise to me, I wasn't anticipating it, but the city of Groton last week finalized their ordinance. Um, Ordinance 199 to update the language to include uh, vaping and smoking cannabis to their tobacco-free uh, parks ordinance. And um, I thought that was really interesting. I sort of almost missed that, so it was kind of a surprise. So um, I have updated uh, my statement that I had submitted to the council to include that information. Thank you. Sure. Now that, you know, obviously is a good first step, but that would not allow for um, fines. If somebody's found to be doing it, you could obviously remove people from the parks, but if you want to be able to find people that will need an ordinance. Okay, thank you. And thank you for your presentation. Um, I'll 
make a motion to recommend a resolution to the town council to prohibit smoking at all town parks. Is there a second? Second, Westerville. Moved by Melinda, second by Westerville. Is there a discussion from the council? Council Portalon? Um, thank you so much for coming and present, uh, presenting this. Uh, you know, I think it's really important as I am a mother of a son up at the high school and had a son who was up there who has graduated. Um, you know, children fear going to the bathroom because there's no ventilation and the amount of vaping going on in there. Um, I'm up at school frequently for different meetings and I can smell the vape pens and sometimes not vape pens, sometimes marijuana gushing out of the restrooms, but it's a thing if they don't see it, they can't do anything. One of the things I was going to be sending forward, I did find that some schools have actually vape detectors, they're not smoke detectors, called vape detectors because they kind of are more of a misty smoke versus a dry smoke from a real old traditional cigarette, back what they used to do up in those same bathrooms when <laughs> I was there. Um, they used to stand on the toilet and smoke because if no one saw you, they couldn't, you know, if they smelled it, they couldn't accuse you of it, they had to see you doing it. Same thing, I guess, is the same policy currently to my understanding. But the smell of these vape pens is so socially acceptable and uh, it's happening on school grounds and in, in the restrooms. And so I really hope that this, our district uh, implements uh, the vape detectors in those small confined areas where it's happening. With that, uh, the flavors and the scents and the smell are just so desirable to our younger population now. We're seeing I think there was a trend where you're seeing less people smoking cigarettes traditionally from my generation, you know, coming out of the graduating in the 90s, late 90s, you know, um, to, you know, early on, uh, you know, 10 years prior to mine, people, uh, schools had smoke areas like outside where people could go actual smoke students um, to my parents talking about, you know, the teacher at the lecture to be smoking while they're writing on the board. Um, so we've really have evolved and we've learned that these things are bad and we still haven't learned about the vaping. Um, so I can understand that it can be kind of insulting to kind of, if you don't want to be around it, it should be in a separate area. You, know, you should be able to exercise and participate without it kind of invading your personal lung space without judgment to anybody else who choose to partake, because I'm not here to judge. If they choose to do that and they're legal, that's on them. Um, they're, that's their right and it's treated no differently than alcohol. Um, it's your, your choice to consume. Um, looking at this though, I have concerns do we have anything that states no vaping on town-owned property currently? That's my question. No, I don't believe, yeah. believe yes, so. Yes, we do. Oh, oh we do. You the floor. Okay. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not aware of that. Manager Burt, do you know if we have that? Excuse me, if we have what? Um, I had asked if we have a ban on smoking on town owned property, vaping. No, no, I believe it's just the state rules on not doing it right by entrance place. Point of I information. Correctly. What's your point of information? Does the town policy also state that there's no smoking at playgrounds or around children on town property? There's a parks rule, but I don't know the whole history of that. You know, we, we have signage at the athletic fields and playgrounds, but it's it's not an ordinance. It's just a voluntary compliance. Thank you, Council Borlaugh. Yeah, I'm probably gonna have to use my second turn after since I'm timed here, I apologize. Um, so what I'm getting at is I'm looking at things like, I'm, I'm, I'm a, as a cancer survivor, I don't like to be around smoke myself, but I think this is kind of premature without having it Townwide, um, the first step would be to make sure if I step out of the door here, no one should be smoking in the parking lot here. I have to walk by that. They should step off grounds. If you work for certain uh, companies now, you have to step off the physical grounds to smoke. So I, I think that that could be something that we need to look at is it's not just our parks. If we're banning it at the park, I shouldn't be exposed to it walking into this building. What's the difference? I'll take my second turn when the time comes. But again, uh, I just want to find efficiencies and make sure that we're looking at the broader picture. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other discussion? Councilor Jones. Uh, Thank you, Mayor Melendez. Um, Director Berry, can you just sort of tell us what we currently have in terms of, is it, is it just signage on 
existing parks? Yes. It's just signage at athletic fields and at, um, and at the playgrounds. Is there any enforcement at all or? It's voluntary compliance. It's not it's, an ordinance. It's just sort of a, sh a sign that says, please don't do right. it. Right. So, um, and this ordinance, this is, would cover sidewalks or not cover sidewalks? Point it's of information? Just, what's your point of information? Is this an ordinance? It will be. Manager Burt, can you correct me if I'm wrong? No, this is all depends on which direction the council takes. If you only do a, a resolution, then it's just a resolution. Okay. But if you, you can also adopt the resolution, but direct staff to begin working on a uh, an actual ordinance, which of course will you know, takes a little longer. Okay, so the council can decide to go either way. Yes. Okay. Uh, point of information. What's your point of information? Um, would we have to post that agenda item? I'm just concerned because this just post says resolution agenda. and it doesn't state. Uh, ordinance which i'm not saying we shouldn't talk about i just want to make sure that that should be another discussion item on, on a separate kind of combination or it should have been added to this manager burt uh you're not actually going to adopt any kind of ordinance i think you can it, it's close enough in relation to this that you could discuss whether you want to pursue an ordinance thank you counter jones you on the thank floor thank you can can you manager burt maybe or somebody just tell me what the difference between a resolution and an ordinance is Resolution doesn't give any kind of authority. Obviously, if you do a resolution and you post the rules um, and somebody's breaking the rules, park staff or police could, you know, remove them from the property. Um, eventually, you know, no trespass them, that type of thing, but you can't find them. So it, an ordinance basically just gives you more teeth. So an ordinance, you would but, have, but it, you, you but might have sorry. penalties behind it and the, and the, the police or whoever would be the authority on this could do something where right. the resolution you couldn't. Um, right. So this is just for town parks and open space. So open space being like Cop Family Park. So yeah, Pequot Woods. Pequot Woods. Yeah, those, um, yeah. So people wouldn't who are doing in the dog park would not be able to smoke. Is that? That's correct. Correct. And can you tell me the um, the rationale for not including the Shinnecosta Golf Course? I'll be up front. You'll have at least 100 people there screaming, and it would hurt the attendance at the golf course. But I think the, the feeling was that it would uh, have a significant financial impact on the golf course. Um, Could you have 100 people screaming at you at Cop Family Dog Park, too? <laughs> who, are, who go there to walk their dogs in a very, very large area and would like to have... There's, yep. I mean, I'm not in favor of <clears throat> cigarettes. I don't smoke and, and right. really smoke, but I'm just wondering about people who go there with their dogs and one place you've banned it and the other place you haven't. Right. Both places where people go to do functions and entertainment. Right. Yeah, that's fair. Is, that, is there a good rationale for that? Other than monetary on the Shinnecosset side? Yeah, when this was discussed with the, the Golf Advisory Board, they were deeply concerned about the impact that it would have um, on the golf course. Same thing on the trails. People, it, people hiking and right. to smoke while right. they're walking. Yep. Okay. Um, so this includes uh, Pequonic Plains, Cop Family Park, um, Pequot. Uh, how about all the pocket parks that we have where kids play? It includes mm -hmm. all of those too. Right. And it would include the waterfront. Um, so I, I guess part of my question here is I know cigarette smoke is an addiction and people are going to these parks to, with their kids for extended periods of time. Not that we want to have people smoking cigarettes around kids, but if it's an, smoking is an addiction, these people do need to smoke. There's, how do we answer that? How do we deal with that? People sort of feeling they need they have to smoke cigarettes who are spending extended months of time in these different parks yeah well I, i'm not sure that we're this is one step towards maybe breaking that addiction is you know by making it more difficult providing less opportunities for them to do that 
Point of information. What's your point of information? The way that the this resolution is written is very vague because it's stating smoking. Is this including nicotine and marijuana? Or is it just nicotine? The way that this resolution is worded? Maybe this is for Manager Burt. Smoking would include both. Of course, you can alter right. it and do whatever you want. Okay, but it's only specifically stating smoking. Right. Not things that can be consumed smoking, by the mouth. But not, it would not include by the mouth edible type things. Okay. All right. Thank you. Council Bordelon. Uh, thank you. The other thing that makes this kind of vague, and once again, it's time. This is the time to pick it apart before you know we got to get to the point of where we're going here. Resolution, ordinance, what should be included, what shouldn't be. I'm concerned that we're going to pick and choose different places and say, oh, we're worried about our revenue over here, but we only care about your health on this side of town, but not when you're here because we're going to lose money. Either we care about it as a public health as a whole, or we don't. That's where I stand. So as a person who has to vote on something up here, I can't pick and choose and worry that 100 people are going to come through here. We've made other votes on things and other people have come through here, and you have to stand on the right side of it. So if you're firmly a believer that you do not want to be exposed to secondhand, it should be across the board. So my thing is, that's why I was asking town properties. <clears throat> that would cover all of it. I am concerned that it says smoking. It should say smoking. The new, the new hip language is smoking slash vaping. Because one would say, he's smoking a cigarette. One would say, she's vaping. Some would say those are different. So I think we really need to define vaping and smoking, inhaling products that are then, you know, drawing back into the environment, in, uh, causing a secondhand effect is the other language they use this day. Secondhand effect. If I'm eating an edible, no one else here is affected. You would know I ate an edible. So it's not, you know, I don't walk past you and, and consume your edibleness, if it was such a word. <laughs> but I would be walking through your vapor cloud. Again, when I drink a bottle of beer or a cup of tea or, I mean, a wine, it's not affecting, it's not, it's a direct effect. So I am worried about the language. It needs to be, we don't wanna just pass something through because we have it before us. It needs to be clean and, and right. I think this is a good diving board, but I am concerned. I think it should be across all public buildings and I don't care how many people show up if you, we can't say you can't smoke at the dog park, but you can go golf and smoke and drink there and that's okay. What side do we stand on? That's a thin line. You know, um, you can't say you can break the law on Friday here, but when you're here, you can't, you gotta, you can't, either you're for it or you're against it. So I say, if you ban it on all town space, that includes the golf course, which is an exercise routine, which they have youth there golfing and role models. What if your son wants to take up golfing? Should he be subject to all the people they're smoking? And no, it should be the free to be free from all secondhand objects. So by doing that, you then would eliminate the opportunity for someone who's walking in to be standing out there. They'd have to step out to the, the road and get off the public property, including town staff that smoke. They'd have to leave the property to smoke. That is a true ban, in my opinion. Thank you. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, in terms of uh, scope and of definitions, there are some uh, models from our neighbors, Stonington and the city of Groton, that have worked through some of this and uh, have good definitions and clear expectations as part of what they've put forward. So um, I think it always is a good idea to put time and thought into it and make sure to get it right. Um, I, I believe that's a, a good point. Uh, point of information? Does she have any What's examples of, of like, if you don't have a mind, I don't want to put you on the spot, but do you have any examples of like some wording that you don't see here that you maybe could share with us? Um, I don't know what's before you in terms of your resolution language. I don't think. Um, I do have examples from other communities. Um, yeah, maybe some of the language that we just talked about that you're seeing that maybe is not clear. That would, be, that would just be helpful just for notes. And if you're able to send those forward, it'd be great to review those. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. I have the city. Oh, okay. I have Stonington. Okay. Is there any further discussion? I have the city, but not the new one. 
Councilor Kasiri. Thank you. Um, so I, I think that we're missing a really big voice in this conversation and whether it's we're talking about a resolution or an ordinance, the people that are going to ultimately end up enforcing these things is the police department. Um, and I know our police department always rises up to the occasion and the challenge, but on convoluted topics such as this, I think it's important to have the perspective on how to measure such things, how to effectively enforce such things. And I'm not comfortable on voting on anything until we have that perspective on how enforcement would look, um, especially understanding whether or not we have adequate staffing to actually enforce ordinances like this. Um, and I think it's, it's important to bring the chief in on this conversation to kind of get that enforcement aspect. Doesn't necessarily mean I disagree with this because I'm a mom, I have little kids, and I, I feel very strongly on some of these things. But as someone has, who has had to actually enforce ordinances like this, we're missing kind of a crucial, um, vital perspective. Um, and in our packet right now, the resolution is just stating, you know, smoking, and yes, it does include nicotine and marijuana, but our packet does actually state alcohol in here. And if we start getting into things that are gonna make this a little messy, it may not be a bad thing to see how that looks. Um, and I think if we're going to talk enforcement, we should have that perspective. So I'm not really comfortable on voting on this tonight. Thank you. I had a point of information. Um, What's your point of information? And I, and I might have missed it. it. Did it speak to the medical side of smoking too? Because I don't know if we could be in compliance with that either. Where would, I'd like the attorney's opinion on that as well. Where, where do we stand on enforcing that? So I'm not sure if that's in here. Does anyone know? What do you mean? Uh, the medical side. If someone had medical marijuana, where does that fit? Um, I I Someone. don't think that, I don't no, know, that I, don't, not, I don't think that would. That was not addressed. Anymore. Yeah, yeah we'd, we'd have to address that because there are people who have post-traumatic stress that are vets and stuff, and if they were having a panic attack and felt marijuana was going to help it, I'm just throwing it out there. Okay. They have a right to use Thank it wherever. You. Council Franco. Thank you for coming. Um, and the council, we have brought up this topic before, and we had a very long, drawn-out conversation about it. We had talked about marijuana. We talked about vaping. Um, we talked about whether this was going to be allowed on sidewalks or not. Um, there's also in this packet, it describes alcohol, where alcohol is allowed on town property, just not athletic fields or playgrounds. Um, as what's discussed, um, penalties or enforcement. Um, also, what are the state statutes on what we can and can't do with the marijuana side aspect of it? Um, what I've heard here today was we wanted to limit the exposure of children from smoke and smoking, and I agree, and we have a policy in place right now that is through Parks and Rec, I, I gather, but it is a town policy that says there's no smoking at parks or around children on our town property. Um, the Shanacosset Golf Course, um, that information is a little concerning to me. Um, and, and smoking at schools is already banned, from what I understand. Um, so our resolution right now is, or the motion on the floor is to recommend a resolution to the town council to prohibit smoking in town parks. That's it, and it's one sentence. Um, and that would be our resolution. And I, I don't think it's, it's enough for any of us to do anything with that. Um, I think it, we dive deeper into understanding of medical marijuana um, and the situations that would arise from that. And, um, and after having this conversation before and knowing where it went, I'm going to put an amended motion on the floor to um, table this topic. I'll second that. I need a time definite. No. Hmm? No. What do you mean no? I'm tabling it. Okay. Uh, motion to table the motion. A uh, uh, point of uh, information. One second. I, I just need to check something. 
I just want to understand uh, the table versus the time definite rule. That's what I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> just before I second that again, just to make sure I understand. I can look it up too. Okay, so from my understanding of briefly reading uh, what I can, laying on the table, we'll just put it back on our regular agenda item list, and then it could come back at any time. Is that your understanding? That is not my understanding. Okay, what's your understanding? My understanding is that we table and it doesn't come back, this, the way it's written here. It doesn't come back ever? doesn't come back but that would just be voting it down I don't understand table you put it on the table and then we vote on it in, in a future I'd rather table it manager Burt what's your understanding of table table it indefinitely you have to take it off the table to put it back on manager Burt do you do you understand postpone indefinitely I, I'm looking I, okay. I want to do a little more reading on it So it looks like what it is, is when you lay on the table, what you're saying is there's something more important. I'm going to set it aside for a bit and we'll take it back up later in the meeting. You want to, yeah. So otherwise you want to, you, if you want to kill a motion, you could say move to postpone indefinitely. Postpone indefinitely. Wow. Amended. Okay. So I have a motion to postpone indefinitely. Uh, point of information. Well, first, is there a second? I'm about to, but I have, I have a, my, my information is regarding that. Okay. With sure. all, um, so if we postpone indefinitely, that means that we'd have to get a certain amount of counselors to bring it back up, or is there a certain time frame? What is what are the ramifications on that? <clears throat> okay, Manager Burt, you can say how you it, interpret this. I think it means you'd have to vote again to unpostpone. Uh, well, it, a year a year after, you're essentially killing it. So a year after, you could bring it back up. But otherwise, you would need the you would need um, you know, to override the vote later, or else you need you know six people to agree to uh, put it back on the agenda. All right, and it would so it wouldn't preclude you to from um, like the discussion that we did have. They could make some edits to this and, and bring it back in that year's time or whatever. No, I think I think you're just postponing. Like you can't bring it back. Right. Would you like me to read the definitions in our sure, yeah, parliamentary great. procedures? Yeah. A motion to postpone indefinitely. This is a parliamentary strategy. It allows members to dispose of a motion without making a decision for or against. This is useful in a case of a badly chosen main motion for which either a yes or no vote would have undesirable consequences. So you yeah. couldn't bring it back. Is there a second? Uh, so it could never come back even if it came back in a different form. I thought it could. I imagine that there could be a, a, a motion to vote for it to be, well, I think that's for the table. I don't know. I, I, I just think this is essentially you're killing it without voting yes or no. It's just, it's the same as if we voted no. Right, but I'm... When, when, I, when you say kill something to me, that means it never comes back. And so right. I so just want to make sure. In our current rules, it means a year. 
you one cannot year. bring this motion back to the floor right here. In one until one year. That motion that's written there. Right. And then at that time, the folks who brought it forward could make edits and bring it back in one year at a different level too, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll second that motion. The, the motion is debatable. Is there any discussion? Uh, Councilor Bordelon. Um So yeah, if it's, I mean, based the way that this is written now, um, I am concerned the, the motion that's here, we do have, like it's stated, we do have a, uh, you know, folks can drink in public parks and things which people have picnics at, you know, things like that. And so I'm just looking at all different areas of, I, I just don't feel like this, it, there's too much. This is, in no offense, it's too vague. It doesn't address the medical, it doesn't, it doesn't have the word vape versus smoke. There's, we're talking, as it's stated by the town manager, there'd be major consequences from par four of a hundred people. Um, we, we can't eliminate areas and not do that for other areas in our town. I, I just can't do that in good faith. Uh, you know, it's like saying this one low income section of town, we're gonna allow that, but because this one will have, just because you're the loudest screamer in the room doesn't mean that your, your conscious and vote should be altered by that. And so that's one thing I don't stand for. So if that does not include that, I can't support something like that. It's, it's not fair or just, and that's what I'm voted to do. And if I like that choice or not, I. I think this is a good decision based on that alone. So that's where I stand. I would love to see this come back. I think we should collaborate, add the medical marijuana, the new laws that have come in place since this has been written, look at ways to collaborate with PAR4. Uh, maybe there could be a designated smoking area, maybe not, you know, little, versus just randomly driving carts, smoking your cigar and your cigarettes and drinking and driving and smoking. It's the only place you can legally drink and drive on a course. It's amazing. Um, but. I think there should be maybe areas, maybe by whole three, four, and five, over here you can smoke, over there, so that as a person who's golfing doesn't have to walk through that and deal with it. They shouldn't be smoking on the golf carts, um, things like that. So there might be a way to make it user friendly, but respecting the wishes. Um, I feel that this would be highly problematic, not to the hundred people coming from par four, the thousands of people that are going to say, you're letting them smoke and not us, that's my concern. So I, I feel like I'm torn. And if I was on either side, I'd feel like it was unjust. So I do think with Councillor Franco's motion, it nails, puts, puts the cigarette out and, and literally makes us move forward and come back to this at a later date. I do think it needs to be something, and I'd like to see something more inclusive where no one's par smoking standing out here when I walk by. You know, it should be town property. And I think that would be more enforceable, um, not just in the eyes of children. We are examples to young adolescents, adults, and everybody around us. I, I, my lungs are compromised in, in, you know, in the, the world of COVID. Who wants any other extra agitators? I don't. So I just can't support it at this time, but thank you. Councilor McBride. Thank you. I'm, I'm not in support of the motion at this time, although I understand its, its meanings. Uh, the main reason I'm not in support of it is because I don't want to wait another whole other year to bring us back to the table. So I am in support of this, of a smoking ban, but I do think, although this is probably 80 or 90% there, I think there's some work that numerous people have mentioned uh, need some fine tuning. So what I would be in favor of is option three, which would be do nothing and have you come back to the table. A lot of work has been done in this already, but I think there's some fine tuning that numerous people have mentioned that can easily um, you know, make this a little bit better and then, then hopefully be voted in. Uh, the one question I did have is you mentioned Stonington. Uh, when and if this ever does come back again, if you can provide the examples, because they have golf courses there, so they must, they must have some idea of, of how they handle it. Because I can see the, the golf course scenario from both sides. Uh, if you're out in the open, you know, that's a little bit different than when you're walking by people. But I would just like to have a little bit more detail and uh, have some of the comments counselors made incorporated into this and have it come back uh, before a year. Thank you. Councilor Baumgartner. 
Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. First and foremost, um, just want to thank Carolyn and uh, Mark for coming out tonight. Um, I know you've been working on uh, these issues, um, especially um, uh, you know, banning uh, smoking uh, in um, you know in many on many fronts. Um, you know, to protect um, public health, which is uh, so important. So do um, want to recognize those uh, continued efforts, especially with our youth um, and. Uh, as far as some of the discussion tonight um, coming in, um, admittedly, um, was not uh, set in stone as far as kind of where I was going to, how I was going to vote. But um, I do think um, Councilor Franco and, and Councilor Bordelon have brought up very important points this evening. Um, in particular, the double standard that does exist by applying uh, a ban on you know one section or one type of park, but not on the other. Certainly. You know, um, we are so fortunate to have Shenandoah Golf Club. Um, but with that said, um, I just don't think it's right to say that you know one one uh, group of folks are permitted to do something, but hikers aren't allowed to, you know, smoke smoke pot, or uh, a parents not allowed to smoke their cigarette on, you know, the the corner of the parking lot during a football game. It's just uh, to me that, that that's that doesn't sit well with me. So. I can't in good conscience support any ordinance that does create tailor-made exemptions for certain groups of people um, because that really does undermine the public health argument in my mind. Um, and then secondly, um, just as far as the um, ordinance goes, you know, we, we've talked about a lot of different issues in town where we've talked about going the policy route as opposed to the ordinance. And I think any future discussion, um, should the conversation be tabled this uh, evening, any future discussion has to be centered on that um, because I. Uh, I just caution the council from, from going the ordinance route um, in large part because then you are then charging um, a, an entity such as the police department to enforce it. And as um, and I, I don't want to uh, uh, quote, quote uh, Councilor Kassiri, don't hold it against me, but I, um, from what I gathered, you stated that's um, kind, of, uh, kind of placing the onus on them to enforce something that maybe um, you know, they ought to, they have many other things to, to worry about um, in addition uh, to um, you know, so I, um, I I do support tabling this motion, and I, I just hope that um, that doesn't mean we necessarily uh, not talk about this in the future. I just think there needs to be a, a lot of um, uh, details worked out. Uh, perhaps if you know if the council doesn't have the appetite to support the tabling of this motion, um, we can refer it to the public safety committee uh, for further discussion. I know it's a it is a standing committee per our rules, and I'm sure the committee would love to work on something right now. Thank you. Mayor? Yep. Um, reading a little bit more into it, I think it just kills it for the day. You can't bring it up before the next regular meeting. The postpone indefinitely. It doesn't appear to postpone it permanently or long term. Basically, it's just a way to get out of it today without having to actually vote on the real motion. Okay. Do we need to get in touch with a parliamentarian? Well, we don't have the ability to do that right now. Um, we have a council parliamentarian. I mean, do you have someone to call? No, it, it's the our rules state that the mayor would um has a parliamentarian, and last I knew when it was appointed, it was uh. Barbara Tarbox. And Manager she would Burke. be called in the middle of, we would take recesses and the mayor would call the parliamentarian and get the input if there were questions about what was on the floor. All right. The council will stand in recess at 755.
Okay, the council's back from recess at 8.03. Manager Burt, what'd you find? If you looked in uh, Robert's Rules of Order itself, the way it reads is, postpone indefinitely is a motion that the assembly declined to take a position on the main question. Its adoption kills the main motion for the duration of the session and avoids a direct vote on the question. That's, so it kills it for the session. Okay, thank you. Um, so is there any further discussion? Okay, I'm seeing none. I'll speak briefly on it then. Um, I am supportive of the smoking ban. Um, so I will not be supporting, uh, well, to be honest, I can, I can support a, a motion to, to kill it for this evening. Um, we obviously don't have the votes here today. I will just speak briefly. I will say, I understand people have concerns that it's at the parks, but not at Shinnecott's golf course. I do, I do understand that. But, but what I will say is if that is your concern, uh, I would, I would anticipate a motion to add Shinnecostic Golf Course to the ban list rather than saying we're not going to do it anywhere. Um, I'm not necessarily saying I'm supportive of, of, of banning at Shinnecostic Golf Course. I understand the, the, uh, uh, the Golf Advisory Board advised us not to do it there, and that's why um, it has been presented the way it is today. But I will say that if your if your opinion is that we should have it everywhere because this is important um i don't think that you should vote it down everywhere when you can have it at a significant amount of parks and places rather than having it nowhere just because you can't have it everywhere so that's what i will say there's obviously no votes tonight to pass this so we can work on it at another date and time um, however i will encourage um I just also want to make one thing clear because uh, in the motion it says there's no specifics in the motions. This is how we typically do it. In the cow, it's just written plainly what the resolution would be. And then when we have the resolution at our council meeting, all the details are there. That's how we do it on everything. This, this is not the motion that will be passed at our council meeting. It would have all the details defining smoking and vaping and, and all the details that you want to see in there. They would all be in there and we can and we can, you know, nitpick on the wording at that time. Um, so the council wants to discuss this at a later date. I can support that, but however, I just want to make it very clear. I am very supportive of this, um, uh, this ordinance or resolution, however it may be. And I don't think that the inability to place the ban at Shinnecostit means that we should throw it all out. So that's what I'll say. Council Borlaug. Uh Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I just think, you know, it needs more revisions. That's it. I mean, it's not a bad thing. <clears throat> I mean, we, there's a lot more things that can agree with Councilor Cassieri. Councilor Cassieri, if we're going to have, who's an enforcers, we should have those options, both resolution and, um, uh, sorry, I'm drawing the blank, resolution and a ordinance things, those both should be written on here. Like at the next one, we should add resolution and ordinance options, both written out, what that would look like. Um, also, we need to talk about the, the legalization of medical marijuana versus recreational. How is that gonna be enforced? So would someone flash their medical card and you know, they said they're having anxiety attack and this is what they're, who's gonna enforce that? It needs to be clear. Um, some of the handouts that were given, consumption, consumption, of tobacco consumption. What does that mean? So if I dip, can I dip at a park? That's consumption. It's not it's not going into the air. So how are we defining consumption? Is it secondhand consumption versus consumable? I mean, I think that needs to be defined as stated. Um, vape pen versus e electronic cigarette versus all the names and smoke. Um, uh, dipping, I mean, are we banning dipping? I mean, some would say we're, we're singling out people, but dipping doesn't affect everybody else. I mean, I don't like the people who throw the dip all over the ground, spit everywhere, but, um, so we just have to be really clear. And then again, 
where are we doing this? How broad? Um, if we're going to say parks, public buildings, you know, as I stated, I do think public buildings should be is no different than a park. It's not your space. It's a public area that people gather, and uh, people shouldn't be subject to it. Um, or are we also going to provide smoking areas on the outskirts of these areas? Okay, so now you have a park. Maybe you might consider like the Navy base does. They have little smoking huts, so now it's a defined area. If you go over there, you're choosing to engage in that. You know, that might be another way. Um, but I do <coughs> hope to see this come back in a way that has a little bit more detail and um, looks at all the different consumable, you know, vaping and all the ways, as well as cross town sectors of how this would work, and maybe some examples of towns that do have smoke-free golf courses. Has it changed their revenues or not? That'd be great to know. I'm going to start my own research. Um, or do they have smoking sections? Um, all great questions and answers. Um, I know it was hard when we went smoke-free at bars, but they did it. They're still making a ton of money. Um, so, you know, as a, as a person who did bartending in college, I'd come home covered in cigarette smoke and used to think it was unfair. Um, but it's, it's working now. It was a hard thing to do, but people made work through it. So I think we can get there. I just think we have to figure out where it is, but we need to be fair across all areas. We cannot single out certain sections. Thank you. I have a point of information. What's your point of information? So are you under the understanding that my postponing definitely means that it can be reconsidered at our next cow meeting? Is that what you're saying? I would go to Manager Burt to answer that question. Or will it my need to six? Is it, it, my understanding is whenever we're ready, we could bring it back up if we wanted to flush out, bring more information to the council. Or does it need six votes to come back? I, I don't think so. I can check with our attorney, but I don't so, believe so. If we voted on the main motion, it would need, and it, if it did not pass, it would need six right. votes to come back. Is that correct. correct? Yes. This is just a way of avoiding <laughs> voting, really. <laughs> Okay, any further discussion? I just have, I'm sorry. Uh, Councilman McBride? I'm, I'm just gonna say, I don't know why we just don't do nothing instead of c concerning ourselves with motions that we're not 100% comfortable with. Thank you. Just... Councilor Borland, you've spoken twice on this. I just had a point of information. What's your point of information? Um, how long would it take for them to get something back? It's not gonna be by the next council meeting if they're gonna do all the research. We're talking months. Yes. Is that correct or? Yes, correct. Yeah. Right, so, okay, thank you. Council Franco. It was just asked about why we're doing a motion like this. So I feel like I have an, a need to answer now um, because people don't want to vote against, um, maybe not put on the record that they're against banning smoking or all, you know, something that has to do with the health concerns of our, our community that we're voting to not actually put a vote on this um, as a postponement because we don't want to take it up and be on the record of having to go against something because of the way it's written. So I'd like to make that quite clear. Thank you. Point of clarification. I think, point my, of clarification? I think my do nothing is exactly that. Do nothing. Any further discussion? Okay, seeing none, I'll call for a vote. So just to be clear, we are voting on postponing indefinitely Council Franco's motion. All in favor say aye. Have, uh, aye. 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 Okay. Aye. Um, how many motions are on the floor? I'm just a little lost because we took a lot of breaks. I apologize. Okay. So Sorry. we're in the middle okay. of a vote. There's only the main motion yeah. and then the motion to postpone. I thought he put on, I, I wanted to make sure Councilor Bride didn't put a do nothing on the floor. Okay. Just want to make sure. Okay. In favor? Who's voting in favor? <coughs> Kasiri. Postpone. Yep. Jones. Franco, Bumgardner. Against? McBride. Abstaining? Okay, so I have. I only have six votes. I think I didn't vote. I'm. I'm in, I'm in favor of postponing it does because I, I thought there was to do nothing on the board along. I voted in favor as well. Okay. Thank Sorry, you. I you had a motion, so. 
Passes seven in favor, one opposed, McBride zero abstaining. It is postponed. Thank you. On to Town Park's overnight camping ban. And we have Director Barry still for this, this motion as well, this item as well. So the, this issue is a Town Park's overnight camping ban. Uh, in, in support of the work that various town departments and outside organizations uh, did in creating the proposed ordinance, the Town Parks and Recreation Commission had recommended the adoption of, of this ordinance regulating camping in town parks and other public places. Uh, the recommendation is that uh, setting a public hearing date for the draft ordinance for March 8th, 2023. Thank you. Any discussion? Councilor Baumgartner? Yes, um, I do have a few questions. Um, who is the proponent of the of this overnight camping ban? Is it the officially the Department of Parks and Recreation? The Parks and Rec Commission supported the work done by other organizations. I believe the town attorney was involved in this, um, and there was a number of groups involved in this. Okay, and I, I'm only asking because to date, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mayor or Town Manager, but uh, we have not discussed this item uh, at all. Uh, and to my knowledge, I, I, this is actually the first I've, I've heard our town working, actually working on this item. Um, typically, just whenever uh, the community, or you know, clearly the Parks and Rec um, Commission has worked on this issue, um, I thought in the past the council sometimes it has brought forth an idea and there's kind of been a back and forth, but um, just having done a little bit of research before the meeting, a, correct me if I'm wrong, but the overnight camping ban is synonymous with how, you know, houseless, houselessness. Um, so I, I in good conscience cannot ban the ability for any person to sleep in our town parks uh, without providing them a, you know, shelter or a, a house uh, for them to be in. Um, if we're not going to provide our own homes to individuals currently living in our community in town parks or town uh, open spaces, uh, I understand there have been camps that have sprung up in the last uh, year or two uh, in Groton as a result of several camps throughout the region shutting down, being uh, a lot more, having a lot more enforcement. But again, and we've heard this time and time again, but uh, New London uh, cannot be the city in the community that inevitably has to deal with houseless and homelessness issues. Uh, this is a regional um, issue. This is, uh, I don't want to call it a problem because these are uh, individuals who are part of our community uh, and deserve to be part of our community just as much as any uh, taxpaying citizen does. Um, until we identify and deal with the systemic root causes of houselessness, uh, we can't even question you know, whether they can or cannot sleep here. So uh, if that's the issue, I think we should call it as such, but I think, I, I, I think uh, it's, it's not even appropriate to call it overnight camping because it's not. They're not camping. They're, they're, they're sleeping in our community because they have no shelter. Um, and uh, I just hope we can indefinitely postpone this and, and um, consider other ways we as a council can deal with homeless issues in, in our town. Mayor? Yes. Uh, one, I think we've had regular camping issues too. Mark, correct me if I'm wrong. I will say with always home since I've been here, everybody can be housed in the community. Uh, it's never been an issue of people want it. So just to mention that there's there's always been housing available for everyone. We always offer it when we run into our officers regularly do that. Always home regularly text in with people say, hey, we can get you in a place and help if you want it. Just to make that clear. Thank you, Councilor Bordelon. Uh, thank you. Again, 
this is not fall as Councillor Baumgartner said that this is definitely not following the the format that we normally do. Uh, this is my first time seeing this. I got it on Thursday. Normally we get a first draft, or if you turn a page back, you can look back at our smoking band. There's nothing written. It's the first read or idea. This one is all typed up, sealed with a bow, and sent to us, and uh, we we haven't had time to discuss this. I, in good faith, I can't ask something like this. Usually we're a part of the process. I can also agree with Councillor Baumgartner. Don't call it camping. Call it what it is. Let's not put a, a name on it to soften the blow of what is going on in our community. If we are having a, a spike in homelessness, which we're in the mouth of a pandemic, let's move the money where we should. We move money, ARPA funding, to things that don't even relate to this. If we have a problem with homelessness in the town of Broughton, again, as I stated before, we get to that line item coming up very, very soon called outside agencies on our budget. It's all of $85,000, maybe, or 90 if, at best. It usually takes the longest to get through and the most back and forth, but we move other large numbers. If Groton is seeing a spike in this, have we considered doing a, we love to do surveys, studies. Have we done a survey or a study? And I feel bad for Mark Berry because he's just a guy trying to run the parks. Really, this is a problem beyond him, actually. I don't think it's even fair that he's the one presenting tonight, in my opinion, humbly, respectfully. You're a, park, you're a parks and rec person, not an enforcer of homelessness. So with all due respect, I respect that. And I, can, I think you're in an awkward position. If we are having a problem in the town of Groton, I've seen cops in different areas, Stonington, dropping people off in New London. We can't drop all our problems off in New London and say we are going to do nothing over here. If we're at the point of writing something up like this, we got a problem. What are we doing about it? Have we thought about opening a shelter? When we had temperatures below zero here, freezing, we opened up a warming center. I, there was nothing fully written up. I messaged with the town manager. Finally, we got something up. And he set up the, the police department's lobby. Even a person who's never had a criminal record, no offense. My mother tried to keep me out of the police department. I don't want to sit in the police department. We should offer something better. And I did some research on that. And I collaborated and looked around in other towns and other states. They, they coordinate with their, their churches. The, the, the city, which is, has the, the lower income side of town, uh, the greatest number, they don't even have any warming centers. Their centers are all the way over here at the police department on the town side, some in their police department as well. But they opened up churches and fed folks during that time. I'm gonna have to use my other turn, but I do think that this is a tip of the iceberg. So let's not call it overnight camping because it's not casual folks just camping. Also, it doesn't state, what if you get in a fight or you had a domestic that night or you just need to get away and you want to sleep in your car for the night at the park? Answer's time is expired. Is a car yeah, also fair. banned as sleeping and camping or just out of the grass? Counselor's time, time, time is fair. expired. Thank you. Manager Burr. First, to make it clear, we're not seeing a spike. It's actually the lowest I've seen it since I've been here. Um, things are going really well on that front overall. Um, we don't know. I don't know if anybody staying at any of our, um, built our grounds anywhere. Um, and there is help for everybody that wants it. Now, in terms of the cold thing, I just want to mention that we do try to help people in hotels if needed. So it's not just, there's just, if you only have two families that need to be put in hotels, it doesn't make sense to call in um, everybody to open up like the schools. Um, if you can just put two people in a hotel, you know, we have our plans in place for that. Um, so I think there's some misinformation there. And then um, in terms of unfair to Mark to present it, this started with Parks and Rec. So it might, it might be unfair, but there's nowhere else it would have started. I mean, there's nowhere else it would have presented it. So, you know, I think it's important to know the background. So that was a bit of a misinformation there given. Councilor Kassir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so to go over the actual content of the ordinance, it states, uh, on page 50 of our packet, it says camp means to do any of the fol following in a public place at any time between the hours of sunset and sunrise on any day of the week. week. To sleep with or without camp facilities or camp paraphernalia, to pitch, set up, establish, maintain, and or occupy camp facilities or use camp paraphernalia with the evident intent to establish or maintain a temporary or permanent place for sleeping outdoors or under any structure 
and or to store camp facilities or camp par paraphernalia. Per camp paraphernalia. Um, Mr. Burt, can you just go over some of the work that um, Ms. Lorena Clark, our community outreach specialist, is doing with some of our homeless population? Sure. Now, she often works in conjunction with a couple of other organizations that are like always home. Like I said, um, since I've been here, anybody who wants a place to live can have a place to live. There's a lot of help out there. Um, but a lot of people choose, some people choose not to take advantage of it, or some people go nightly into hotels. Um, but uh, Lorena works with a couple different agencies. There's another group out there, Malta, um, also that deals with homelessness. Uh, Lorena works with both of them, goes out on site sometimes with their people who specialize in homelessness. Um, and uh, she, along with those groups and police check if they do know of any homeless person anywhere they before any weather they go out and check out and make sure they have a place to stay um so they make sure nobody's out in the cold at all um so she she's pretty active in it but like i said there's two partner organizations that specialize in it that she works with great thank you and this ordinance is not stating that the town police department would prosecute any individuals who are in need of a home correct Like I, like I said, you know, we, if our officers come across someone, they're, we're you know, usually offered to take them somewhere where they can get some help or to call somebody. Once they just notify these other agencies, hey, we have someone that might need your help. You know, they're, they're very accommodated to try to help people. Great. So again, this is not precluding officers or Ms. Clark or anyone in our town, human services, whoever it so may be to provide assistance to individuals who are in need of shelter. Um, this also doesn't prohibit officers, human services, anyone from contacting 211 so that they can get in touch with the Homeless Hospitality Center or also have the Homeless Hospitality Center um, put individuals up in hotels, correct? Correct. Thank, Excuse me, correct. Thank you very much. Council Franco. Thank you. Well, I'd just like to say I do have an RV and I, I might want to park it and camp at some of our, our town parks, just to let you know. Doing some boondocking around town. Um, and just to let you know on a serious note, it is a big thing where people are traveling through and they like to boondock and they want to just stop at a park. They don't want to hook up to any of your facilities. They just want to stay overnight somewhere. So I am in favor of actually that. Um, Mr. Burt, um, can you just tell me, is, I, I know we've had the homeless hospitality work with us um, in regards to some people that in the past had camped in some of our, um, on our town property. And my question is, is the homeless hospitality in favor of people camping on our property? Or what, what, is, what is their stand on that? Do they think well, we should maybe the, give them sorry. property to stay on? I mean, what, where do they stand on this? Again, they have they they have enough resources to help people. Their goal is to get them into a safe environment. So they don't think we should. Let me just ask it this way: Do they did they any time ask us to give them place for them to stay on our property? No. Or do they encourage that? No, they they encourage to not stay out in the open. All right. Um, and as I'm reading on section four, it says this ordinance does not provide for criminal penalties of any type or degree for its violation, and it shall only be enforced by civil or equitable means. Can you explain equitable means? I didn't write this. I wasn't involved with the writing of it. Mr. So Barry? Sure. The Parks and Rec Commission did not write this. This was presented to us and asked if we would support this ordinance as it was written and the commission said yes and you know where it first came from mark i don't remember it's been around for a couple of years now hasn't it yeah i I'm, i don't know the origin of this I, again it was presented to the parks and rec commission uh, because it involved parks and the parks commission voted to recommend or support this ordinance as it was written. 
All right, well, I, under your best ability, <laughs> when it would say something about being forced with equitable means, does that mean anything to you? Does it, like, is it meaning we would help people? Like more like fair or reasonable means. Right. All right. Yeah, I think the goal was to try to exhaust all possible opportunities to provide a safe space for these folks to stay. All right, and now that I, I have you on the mic, what do you think about boondocking in our town? So boondocking is just driving. It's not a phrase that I'm familiar with. Like so it's just driving up and parking someplace. Staying overnight in, a, in like a parking lot of a park. In a self-contained vehicle. Like an RV, that, yes. A drivable an RV, RV that has a toilet in it and everything. Yeah. But that does take place in, in, at different parks, particularly Esker Point, the parking lot. We have folks that stay over there, stay there overnight. All right. With this and the ordinance that we have before us, does that, the way I'm reading it, it would preclude that. It would say that that would not be allowed. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I, do I have any time left? Did I have anything? Yes, yes. Um, I struggle with this one because I do remember when we did have, I mean, if we're talking about this as a whole, and I understand what you're talking about, um, Councilor Baumgartner, I do know that when they did break down a camp and how bad the situation was in that area and how they had to clean up that area, and it was really bad. And I think it did cost our town $15,000 to clean up a camp out there. And from the feedback that I had received was the Homeless Hospitality Center encourages people not to live in, in our, out in the woods or in our town properties because you don't want to encourage it because you want them to get help. You want them to get into the system and actually get help for what, whatever's going on with them. So on one hand, I really, I really understand this and I'm in favor of it to a degree. Um, I, I wish it was a little bit um, softer on some of the boondocking, because I, I, um, because it's basically just people stopping overnight and moving on. But, um, but it's a tough one. But I, I think I might be in favor of this one. Thank you, Councilor Jones. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, if, uh, Mr. Mayor, if I understand what you said earlier, the Parks and Recs Commission didn't write this. No. And you didn't write this. No. And it just came from somewhere. Yes. Did did anybody vet this? Where did it come from? I mean, plan of information, where did it come from? It, Councilor Jones, you have the floor. Councilor Barlon, you're out of order. Okay. Councilor Jones, you have the floor. Did, did, did anybody vet this ordinance, resolution, whatever it is? I'm not sure where it came from. I was just looking at my files and I have nothing other than the communication from the Park to Rec Commission. I, I don't know where else it would have came from. Is it an outside organization? So is this a normal... Is this Sorry, a, I'm going to take a break. I thought it did. Is this a normal way we received ordinance and things in this manner where they just, nobody seems to know where they come from? Oh, I thought it was parts of right. <laughs> so, yeah, when, um, when yeah. we receive this, and this is what happens when you assume, um, I assumed not only that the council had seen it, but that um, you know it had been fully vetted, and we were asked. The commission was asked to support this again because it's on park property, but the I can guarantee you that the Parks Commission did not write this document. So are you okay with this coming on something that the Parks and Recreation Commission didn't do anything and you guys didn't do anything with it? This just sort of appeared. I, I think it's a good ordinance, but I'd rather if, if Parks and Rec hasn't vetted it, well, had the attorneys vetted it, I'd rather have the attorneys vetted it. Right. So is this another case like we just had? Is this a do nothing, Mr. Manager? And let somebody I, go I back and relook so. at it. I would say so, but I'd also like to hear from the council, maybe not whether it's tonight or another night on like right. the boondock. You know, obviously this is just a draft that can be amended too. So right. there's other changes or other things. 
So it's nice to know those before I send it to the attorneys who review if there was something else you wanted me to look into. Um, the third paragraph in the, on page 49, it talks about that the requirements of the state of Connecticut has rigorous requirements for campgrounds that would not be feasible for the Parks and Rec Department to institute and maintain. Do you have a sense of what those regulations are compared to what we're writing here? Like, what's, are they really, really strict? And yeah, so a few years ago, there was a, a scouting group that was looking to kind of establish an area that they could camp at occasionally. And we contacted the Department of Health Legislate, and they kind of directed us to state regulations. And in order to set what they considered a camping area up, would have required uh, it just wouldn't have been feasible for us to do that because the requirements from this from because the state, of, right the state requirements are much yes stricter. yeah um, I mean we we thought it would be as simple as you know putting a portalette out in the camping area but it it it's, wasn't it's it wasn't that, that simple. So. Um, okay, I've, I've gone back through old emails and everything else. Like I said it's been a while. This has been vetted by the by the attorney. There was a group that was, um, I think Malta first, it might have even come from Malta. Malta first asked for this, and then we sent something to Eileen to look at. So Eileen had vetted this. It's been quite a while. But I would still say, if you want stuff looked at, like, um, you know, boondock or anything else, let me know, you know, then we can always look at that. What's the procedure for doing? Either do nothing or do. Well, yeah, and post but you could give me some guidance. Yeah. You know. Okay. <clears throat> so first, I just want to say, uh, Manager Burt, I remember um, there was a series of meetings which I sat in. I know you were there. Councilor Parker was there. I, I our, our town attorney was there. There was even, um, I believe, an attorney from Waterford who had dealt with this same thing in their town. My understanding was that this is where this came from. It went to the, the Parks and Rec Commission um, for their approval. So first, am I, am I remembering this correctly? I think you are. Okay. Okay, so there's that. Um, to counter Jones's question, um, sounds like do nothing is the best course of action today for me. Mm -hmm. um, the town manager does seem uh, uh, does seem to um, want some feedback from us. In in do we want if, to if do you this have at any, all? If you have any, you know. Do we ha do we want this at all? Or and if we do, what changes would you want? So. So I mean, I, I think basically it gives you some. Uh, let me back up. The question is, what do we have now that we use to do any of the things that are in this? We don't have anything. We don't have anything. So no. this would give other than it, it, I think in the parks rules and regulations it says no overnight camping. But again, it's not. There's no teeth to it. So this has been flushed out. This is much more extensive and gives a set of, of guidelines of what you can do around camping and the right. things around camping. Right. Um, I, I I agree with the council Franco on the boondoggle. Boondocking. Boondocking. <laughs> <laughs> Boondocking. I think. I, I think anything else that we think of that should. I mean, that's clearly something. You know, RV is a big uh, part of people my age. <laughs> hey. <laughs> oh, you have. Um, so I think it should just be looked at a little bit further. And um, I, it just. I'm a little. How these things just sort of appeared would be nice to, to know either it came from us or a little bit better trail of how it came here, but. If that's if it came from Waterford and stuff, um, so is this a, a motion to do nothing, or do I just? Um, or I no, mean, no, no, no. I'm in favor of giving that. Come back, right? Yeah. I, no, and I would say Parks and Rec Commission should weigh in on the on the boondocking type of thing too, because you know to see what they think of allowing it. Okay, so right now no one has put a motion on the floor, so do nothing would just no one makes a motion. Sure, sure, sure. We right. we finish our discussion and we move on. Okay. Right. Would we still have a public hearing on March 7th? No. No, no, okay. no one's made the motion. So we just, they just go back and kind of look at it. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. right. I, okay. I can agree to that. So. Um, Councilor Bordelon. Uh, thank you. I'm just a little, I just, you know, I mean, I, 
to be frank, I'm a little embarrassed. Uh, you know, and you know, you said, oh, okay, so Mark Berry, how do we have someone representing it that didn't write it? We didn't know where it came from. It's a gypsy ordinance that already had a public hearing date. This is not the process that we ever have done. I just ask that we slow it down. Like, it's great to pass things, but we want to pass great things that we don't, you're worried about 100 people who smoke from par four, but we're not worried about everybody else and the ramifications. Just sending it through without, oh, there was a meeting with Juan and Juliet that I just heard about and the town manager and a few others. I didn't hear about that before. Uh, I mean, let's do a first read on something. Like, I mean, half the time we can't even get public hearings for things we need for. This one's already set. I mean, I do think that there's an issue and this is arising from an issue. The next thing we're talking about is, you know, drug and addiction. A lot of homelessness is a direct result of addiction. And a lot of people can't continue to use when they go to a shelter. That's why they won't go. We have to understand the cycle here. Okay. So understanding that then would understand why someone wouldn't want to sit on a cold night in the police department if they have a heroin problem, if they're cold. I, they can't use there. They don't feel comfortable. So we have a problem. And I think it's bigger than this quick fix and boondocking is a nice, great idea you know, to do. But what about the boondocker who does own an RV and parks every night? You're not going to exclude them because if they show up every night to park there, they are homeless in their RV. I think we're ahead of the gun here. The first thing is to really look at the numbers. And I know John said that some false information. What I'm saying is the information, I think human service should be around this table, local drug addiction enforcement uh, folks from human services. This is not just a parks and recreation thing. We need somebody who has, not saying you don't have empathy, Mark, but someone who works in that field of homelessness, sitting at this table, helping us to understand how to work with this, as well as addiction services, you know, Mark oversees parks. He doesn't enforce who's homeless and how we got there. He didn't write this. I just don't feel we have the information before us, and I feel a little embarrassed right now. Um, and I will say that. I feel embarrassed for us. We cannot send things to the agenda. There's many other agenda items that did not even get on. We have this item that I want to say is wasting our time. There's items that have been on there for months and almost a year, and people are saying, we're getting no work done. This is why we're getting no work done. We have things on the agenda that no one even knows where the gypsy dropped it off and who got it. That should be vetted before we sit here as a council. It's we're all volunteers that's wasting our time. So here's another do nothing item that took us until 840 to figure out that we're gonna do nothing. Let's get better here, come on. And you wonder why there's problems up here and disagreements? Process these agendas in a more effective manner. Councilor's time Thank has you. expired. Okay. okay. One, one, can I just respond? Okay. Decorum. Come on. First of all, I know where this came from. I don't. I sat in a series of meetings. Just to be clear, it was an open invitation to the entire council. Councilor Parker and I showed up. Um, Malta was there. H homeless Hospitality was there. Okay. And they recommended this. That doesn't mean that I support or don't support. I sat in a meeting. I was there to learn about this issue from them. Um, we had attorneys there that had worked on this issue in other towns. Uh, and so just to be clear, I remember where this came from. Uh, just to be clear, this is recommended from people who work in this field every day, and they have resources to house these people. These, this is a very complex issue where some people choose to live outdoors even when they have the opportunity to live indoors. This is a very, very complex issue, okay? So just so you know, this didn't come from nowhere. This came from Malta, homeless hospitalities, meetings. We sat with attorneys, law enforcement. Uh, so I just wanna make that very clear. I also want to make very clear that there was an open invitation for all counselors to attend every single one of those meetings. So that also needs to be made very clear. Councilor Kassiri. Ma be, uh, Manager Burt, would you, like, would you like to say something package. as well? Yeah, I just wanna say, um, and part of the, what we ran into last week is we had, it was really weird. We had several items that got suddenly postponed to the 28th. And now we have a really packed agenda on the 28th. Most things we do, we need lead in time. This has been sitting in the system since 
last year, you know, since last summer probably. So it was already set to go in the system and then just kind of, we never pulled the trigger on it to go further with it. So I, I had almost nothing we could put, you know, because mo almost everything I need to have staff work on at least for a couple of days. And so I had a day, I, on the day of, I had to put together what things we could do work on. So that's why we've got some odd things tonight. It was either cancel the meeting or look at some of these things. So it was very, like, literally like an hour to decide everything. And so I ran it by the mayor and, uh, and so that's what we had to do, so. Thank you, Councilor Kasseri. Thank you. Councilor Jones, I like boondoggle better than <laughs> boondocking. Just wanna say that. Uh, Mr. Burt, um, you also briefed the council in several um, town manager reports. Um, you sent us pictures about some of the encampments that the town was dealing with. And I also was on the email chain involving the many different entities that were dealing with this specific issue. It was a process to try and get to this place. Um, so I do agree with the mayor. Mr. Burt, can you just go over um, if fire and EMS um, has given an opinion or expressed an opinion on trying to get fire and EMS services to some of these encampments and the di difficulty of accessing people? Well, uh, of course, uh, Chief Fasaro for the police was involved and we had, like uh, the mayor said, police um, from other communities. I can't remember if we ever had fire. Like I said, it's been a year and I'm having trouble remembering everything. But um, but like the, the camp that we, you know, the biggest camp we've had since I've been here is at behind the, the, the one church near the off High Rock, near High Rock. Mm -hmm. um, and luckily, as we were going through this process a year ago, it just so happens almost everybody left it. So it was a good time to, to help the last couple find a home, um, working with those agencies and then, and then uh, get it all cleaned up. So it just kind of worked out well that way. Um, usually in the past, it was pretty full and you could not get, you're, you couldn't get anything back there in a hurry. It, uh, it'd be like going into the woods, I guess. I suppose it'd be like going into the, the real woods is part of um, you know the state parks at Bluff Point, so it'd be similar to that. Right, and as someone who has worked in emergency services in the past, it is a it is a issue to try and get medical services to some of these encampments because they are buried in the woods, and if someone does need services, then it would be tragic to have that lapse of emergency response time. Uh, Mr. Burke, can you just go over some of the the hazards dealing with like hazardous materials with the cleanup and the bio hazard. Yeah, yeah, that's part of it. You know, and we actually, Ledge Light had issued an order to clean up, if, if you recall that. Yes. Um, they'd actually said we had to clean up the cap um, or else we'd start getting fined every day because it was bad. I mean, there was junk and trash throughout the woods. There was, you know, you know, places where people you know, are using regular areas for restrooms and you had to take care of that. And so it wasn't a pleasant, you know, not a pleasant cleanup. Right, I, I just think it was, it's... It, was quite, it was quite a process to even find somebody that was willing to do it. Right, and, and I think it's also important to highlight some of these things that we may not wanna have conversations about that there are unsanitary conditions when it comes to these types of sites. And we wanna make sure people are living in the healthiest um, means possible. Um, so I did just want to highlight some of those things. I understand that we're going to kind of wait on this and I understand that, but I did want to highlight that there's a reason why we reached this point and I saw the emails that got us to this point. So there's a reason why we're here. Thank you. I'd like to make a motion. I have the floor next. What's your motion? I'd like to do number three, do nothing. It's our option. Do you don't have to make a motion for oh, that? We're not going to do it. I just want to it's not a Councilor Baumgartner. Yes, I'd like to make a motion. <clears throat> What's your motion? I'd like to, well, my microphone broke. <laughs> um, I'd like to make a referral um, to the Public Safety Committee regarding this agenda item. I'll second that. Um, so you want to, it, so, okay. This is referred. This is referred to the committee of the whole. Yes. You want to move it from committee whole to public safety. Yes. Okay. All right. Is there a second? I second it. Okay. Uh, 
I got a motion by Councilor Bumgarner, second by Councilor Bordelon. I'd like to put a motion on the floor. All right, what's your motion? I would like to uh, make amend a motion to bring this back to the council and have experienced people um, to discuss the topic with the whole council, organizations um, that are more experienced this, with this matter um, and can explain it, which includes possibly Malta Homeless Hospitality Center, Police, Fire, EMS, and Ledger Light Health District, because um, okay. that's my motion. All right. <laughs> um, Manager Burt. Yes. I've never had a motion to. I'd like to get. A, can I get a second? second I've never had either it? of these. A second or motion. Okay. I just need to understand if this motion is in order in the first place. I've never had a motion to refer a motion from the cow to the cow. I've also had never had a motion to refer from the cow to another committee. Um, I think I can just do that myself. I don't. I don't really think that needs a motion either. I don't know how I you feel about this. That, yeah, I would agree on that. Yeah, can I've I never speak, seen these. Can I speak to my suggestion? Sure. The reason I asked that it be brought back to the full council is because, um, as from experience, if it goes to sometimes a committee, something as big as this, the same questions will all come back to the council again. And then it will have to be rehashed once again at the council. So instead of doing it and it repeating itself all over again with the same Committee, like committee members as well as the organizations, I think we should do it here as a whole in one meeting. And while I'm reading this, um, while there are issues maybe where it came from and how it got to the Parks and Rec Committee um, Commission, it also says that they unanimously supported this endorsement of this ordinance. Um, so I agree that there are um, difficult conversations to be had, but I would like to do it here at the council, and I would rather not just, number three, do nothing. I want it to come back to us and have a full discussion and, and really find out what we, we as a council should be doing on this matter. Thank you. Okay. Um, Manager Burr, I don't think these motions are in order. Do, do, you, do you think they're in order? I could be wrong. I just, I just don't. Referring to a, co a, a committee is an order. I, I mean, it can be done. It's Probably already can be in done. the cow. Yeah. I mean, obviously you, you would have also had the ability to refer it, but. I would just like to postpone to a, a future. Well, concept. your motion is to. Bring it back to the cow in a future with other guests to continue the discussion basically. So if you did a, if you did this time did a motion to postpone indefinite, then that's what we would do. Take that direction and bring it back once we have people lined up. Okay. I am struggling to understand how this is different from doing nothing. Um, so. I'd like to make a motion then. Can I do a motion? No, we have indefinite? three motions on the floor. All right. I thought you said one was possibly out of order, so I was ready to add another one. We have three motions on the floor. So let me know when it's all. Okay. So Councilor Frankel's motion is to is, it, is this your same motion postponed indefinitely? Well, it's postponed to a meeting, future meeting. Okay, which one? I don't have my calendar. Okay. Point of information. And I don't know how long it's going to take. To how long would staff. it take the town manager to get somebody set up? Well, you know, part of it is if you're talking to several groups, we'll have to discuss the date to see what works for everybody. Okay. So it's hard to name a date. Can I set a tonight? tentative date for me, potentially March 14th? Would that work, work for you? We, yeah, we would just need to put it on the agenda, and then if we're not ready, we would basically just right. put a note that you know it, you know that it's going to be taken up at another time. That All right. Type of thing. Postpone tentatively till March 14th. Okay. I'll second that. It's already been seconded by McBride. Okay. okay. Council Bordelon. Um, yeah, I think that's a good plan. I, and then if you could find out where the draft came from, um, the example draft, um, maybe some surrounding towns drafts, uh, you know, the attorney's opinion section, 
uh, just, you know, we really need to make sure, you know, so we don't waste any time uh, that we have all the people around the table. I think, uh, again, I'll state that I don't think this is a Parks and Recs, pre you know, full by, their, by themselves. It's not their full, uh, in my opinion, job to do something like this. I think human service should be a collaboration of, of multiple departments. Uh, and that, that can sometimes happen. And this is one where I think human service should be involved as well. Um, but I guess my question is to uh, Mark Berry. It states that the whole Parks and Rec were in, in favor of it. What, you guys liked it word for word? Yes. And you guys don't see any concerns in this current write-up? When the commission voted, they did not identify any of the concerns that have been brought up this mm -hmm. evening. And in response to the fact that there were meetings held, it's great. I mean, some of those meetings unfortunately conflicted, so I know it was brought up that uh, these meetings were held just because other counselors don't attend. It doesn't mean that they don't want to. It doesn't mean that the time always works. I, there's a lot of things that, you know, um, with it being so far back, what I was asking is that we are kind of brought back into the loop about that roundtable discussion. It should be kind of in here. Okay, there was meetings held. See, you know, email. I mean, how many emails? We can't delete them. They're, you know, to search back that far. It'd be nice to just, so we don't waste as much time, have more information than the public hearing date and everything drafted up, ready to go. A little bit more of the backstory, uh, especially if it was from years ago or a year ago. It, it, I mean, this is, there's nothing here. And there's no way you can remember every item. <coughs> Um, and again, as it states, other items don't come like this ready to go with a hearing saying, here's your draft. Um, so, it, you know, just when a few counselors attend a meeting, it's still important uh, to, to add some of those thoughts in here. And then when asked tonight, folks could not remember initially where any of it came from. So at that point in time, uh, neither could I. And that, that's a concern. So if we were not going to have a meeting tonight because there was nothing to put on, then make sure the items that were investigated have all the information needed uh, so that we just don't spend time asking questions about, like, where did this come from? Um, so, yeah, I think we, we have a lot of work to do here. Um, and it's not called camping. I think you would have the proper services around the table if you actually called it homelessness and camping. Uh, I think that's a better name for this. Thank you. Councilor McBride. Thank you. Um, I just have a quick question. We, we covered a lot on camping, but one thing we didn't discuss was uh, Section D, which is talking about the personal property removal and disposal. And not for tonight, but for when this comes up again, I would just like to see some information on how that's being handled currently, because I would imagine we deal with that even without this ordinance in place. And, and just want to make sure how, we, how we're handling that procedure for disposing of equipment. Thank you. Thank you. Can you repeat what section? D, page 51. All right. So I'll call for a vote to postpone to the March 14th meeting. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, carries unanimously, I believe, eight in, uh, eight in favor. Thank you, Director Barry. Can we get 10 minutes? Sorry. We'll stand in recess. Council will reconvene uh, in 10 minutes.
All right. Okay. Council's back from recess at 9.08. And we are on to the National Opioid Settlement Acceptance and Allocation Method. We have representatives from Community Speaks Out uh, to uh, give us some background information on the topic. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for having us and inviting us. And I want to also thank you guys from the last vote that you took a few months back. Uh, this is the second wave of money that, that's coming through. Uh, and the first one was $22,000. And I think uh, we, what we want to do, and this is our board, just four of us. There are four others uh, that couldn't make it tonight. We had a meeting before this, so they were on Zoom because of COVID and different reasons. Uh, but what I want to do is explain what the money is used for and what we've done. Uh, the, our group started right where Council Bumgarner is sitting. It was about seven years ago today that I had announced that my son had an addiction issue. Uh, and the reason I announced it was because the week before, when we found out, we realized uh, by going to a community church that was only three quarters of a mile from our house uh, that we had a major problem. Um, Tammy and I both pride ourselves in knowing everything about our community, knowing that uh, you know every student, every person that touched our lives, that we knew who they were and what they were up to. And we walked in that basement of that church seven years ago. There were three of my former baseball players that I coached and 75 other members of the community that were fighting this disease almost alone uh, with no help in the dark. And when we left that room that night, we, we met our friend Linda, who was in the proper meeting because we went to the wrong meeting. We went to the meeting in Narana where folks were, were in, in the addiction. And we thought we, thought we thought we were going to the parents' meeting, which was just up the, up the next floor. Um, and after that, you know, we, the reason we announced here on the council was because we saw the problem. Uh, and and we, we've also adapted to where we are today. Community Speaks South, our main mission was that we were going to raise enough money to pay for everybody that came to us and wanted help. Uh, we found out it's about $1,000 a day and realized how many people that were in our community that were hurting, that was an impossible number. Um, so what we did was we taught families over the last seven years how to deal with their loved ones how to accept them where there are. This, this is the only disease that you'll ever find or encounter uh, where the parents and the families participate as much as a doctor does, even more so. Where, where uh, you know, the, the bill that you guys were just talking about before this, uh, the homelessness, the, the reason people don't find uh, shelter is because they can't. Uh, the, those are all correct statements that were made earlier in that discussion, because uh, it is complex and this, this disease is. Uh, so what we did find out was without money, uh, you can't do a lot. Uh, so we've relied on our local businesses, uh, family members, board members who reach into their own pocket a lot of times uh, to make things happen, to network, to make sure that we can supply people with good safe spaces to be in and also give good information. We're in the schools. Uh, we have a, a play where we hired a playwright. It was uh, the brainchild, I think, of Tammy. Uh, and we hired a, a playwright. And you'll be seeing, hopefully, Fitch perform the play one day. Uh, we had it copyrighted, and uh, it's going to be pretty powerful. But those are the things that we're doing. We're kind of outside the box. We're not an agency. Uh, when you guys agreed to give $22,000 to Community Speaks Out, uh, it didn't go into salaries. Uh, we're all volunteers. Uh, this is an organization that if we, I don't think we completely track our volunteer hours donated, uh, but it's 100% volunteer. And, and any expenses we have goes directly to our place. Uh, we're located at 214. Thame Street in Groton. And for the last seven years, we've held a meeting on the third Wednesday of every single month, uh, even through COVID. Uh, we did the Zoom thing just like it, you guys had to do. Uh, but we're back in regular meeting. We're in our building. And what we're finding is uh, that our next mission is to create the safe space for people that are fighting the addiction. Uh, and what that means is a bigger building, possibly uh, a place where people can just have a place every single day. Where you can walk in, we you know we just had a karaoke event at the at the. See, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, we had a karaoke event at uh, at the Elks Club, and we rent that building often to do events and give them places to be. And someone asked me, well, can a kid come? And right in my mind, immediately, I'm like, nah, I don't know about a kid in karaoke because that's drinking and fun. Uh, and then when they came, and and the young lady sang, uh, it was actually fun and she she enjoyed it it was i'm sorry melissa that's okay. yeah 
I'll, so I'll talk I think, forever. So. so I think what Joe is saying, that we're able to adapt. Um, that's one thing about Community Speaks Out, and that's what's great about being a nonprofit and having board members, that we're able to be fluid. We're able to meet our community members right where they need to be met. Be met. We're able to adjust um, quickly. Um, we have it set up that way because addiction um, makes you have a rapid response. Uh, it's not something that you can wait for. Um, and so we do that through various different things. We have um, gone, we've done some legislative things um, for sober housing. Um, uh, I was one of the first um, people in the state to be able to certify houses along with another lady. Um, we also were able to, we realized that there was needs for sober activities. Um, there was a huge need for sober activities. Connectivity is what we're about. We're about connecting people together. We're about making connections with people, important connections, long lasting connections, because addiction sometimes strips you of your loved ones. Um, so with that, we're hoping that um, y'all would be able to help us, help you guys have a healthy community. A lot of the things that we are fighting with addiction are very complex. You were just talking about two different things that actually relate to us about how when the marijuana and the dispensaries come in, how are we going to adapt with that? How are we going to adapt to homelessness? Those are all things a part of addiction. Um, and they're complex. <clears throat> they, uh, it's not just a ruling that happens, but it's also about the connectivities and understanding where people are coming from and getting around that and having deep conversations. We're also partners with a lot of different people in the community. Um, we do not make the decisions. We all, all the board members are working board members and we all come from various different backgrounds. However, we also make sure that we attend um, and to see what resources are out there, how we can fill in. We're not trying to duplicate anything. We're just trying to fill in where there are, um, where there are gaps in the system. Um, and we're able to do that. We're able to provide them with resources, whether it be money, whether it be Narcan, whether it be training um, for their staff. Um, and many of the homeless people, they carry everything on their back. We're able to figure out where can they leave their things, why they go to rehab, that it will be safe. A lot of people don't go to rehab, which we don't realize because they are carrying everything on their back. Everything that they own is being carried with them. We would like to provide them with a, with a safe, clean place where they would be able to be able to meet those needs. So that's, that's, our, that's our vision. And, and, and when you think of 100,000, and we don't know exactly what the number is. I, we saw some numbers that were on the agenda uh, over a course of 18 years. I think in the agency, when, you, when someone looks at 89,000 or 100,000, uh, that, that, that could be one person's salary that's making things happen. Uh, $89,000 to a group that's like us, that's grassroots and all volunteer, uh, there's a multiplier there that you can't really add. You can't, you can't compare that to any other group and the work that would happen. Uh, and beside the fact that we are so local to Groton, uh, a lot of, the, a lot of the, the, the things you guys just discussed again about the homelessness, we don't have a recovery navigator that, that's assigned to Groton. Uh, we've had pe folks that were addicted, overdosed, they end up in a hospital. Uh, in fact, Tammy and I were there helping one of them, uh, and we're not recovery navigators. We haven't been through it, so there's a big difference. You need someone that's been through it, and the person was called from, it was, I think, Waterbury, uh, and that navigator got there about an hour and a half, which we know when someone overdoses, they usually make a decision to leave the hospital 10 minutes after they wake up. We were able to get this person to stay. Uh, wait for the navigator. The navigator got them to agree to go get help. Uh, now we have navigators that are in Norwich. Uh, they're not here yet. Uh, we have one that we're hoping that's going to be in, that's going to be assigned to us in Groton. Those are the kind of things that we're going to collaborate with. So if we got a bigger space, and our space we love. Uh, it's something that we talked about tonight. We grew into it, one room at a time, and then we rented the next room to us, and we're kind of outgrowing it currently. We have we have folks. Again, moms and dads that just last month, and it, it always reminds me when the mom and dad come in and just found out that their 
18 or 20 or 30 year olds addicted uh, and they are frantic. They're as frantic as Tammy and I were or Linda. The, the day we found out that our kid was possibly going to die that day, we had no idea. Um, and those are the people that we hope trying to help and address. And, uh, you know, we have a letter in there that I hope you guys get a chance to read. It's from one of the families that we've helped. And, and that letter could be duplicated 500 times in the last seven years. Uh, Tammy's on the phone daily. Uh, and, and really, it's about connection and Linda. Uh, it's about connection. So when you call and you just found out, we had a, a gentleman that daughter's overdosed and he was in health care. That's what he did for a living. Could not get his daughter. She hard detox in his basement at his house because he did not have the means. Uh, when people call Tammy or Linda, uh, they get them connected. And that's not because they're any smarter or faster or it's their connections to the sober homes, to the to, to all these different people that we've had connections with. And it's, I, I wish, you know, I invite you all to come to any of our meetings because I think that's where you learn the most. Uh, when someone that's been through it, through the fire, stands up in front of us and tells us how, how that, her or his life went and where they are now. And sometimes they're still in active addiction when they talk in front of us, and sometimes they're in recovery. Uh, but we're always there to meet them exactly where they were, and that's what, that's what uh, Melissa was talking about. Um, I would like to share just um, one story. Is my mic on? Yeah. Is it? Um, we had a Narcan training last month in our office. We um, have a new board member from Reliance in Norwich. And he did an Narcan training, and we had a very full house, barely could house everybody. And Narcan was, uh, like I said, trained, and they were handed out Narcan before they left. And we did have an overdose here in Groton. It took five, it took five Narcans to save him, because the things that are in now, it's pretty much no heroin, it's all fentanyl. And the things that are in fentanyl, it's, it's pretty powerful. And one of the Narcans that came from our training saved that person's life. So that's pretty powerful stuff that we're actually getting Narcan in the hands to actually save the residents of Groton. So I just wanted to add that. It's not just dropping it in people's hands, it's teaching them how to use it. Um, I don't think most people, before that training, the kid that, that was part of saving somebody said, you know, I don't think I ever would have did five of them because they learned at that training that you can give someone as many as and it doesn't hurt them. Uh, but to give somebody five before they woke up, that's just a <laughs> skill that you taught somebody. Um, and you know, when Tammy and I first got back and, and they, they were training us how to use Narcan, it's, it's emotional. Uh, you know, you're, you're in this place where you didn't know your loved one was addicted and now you're watching somebody perform this Narcan training in front of you and saying, why do I have to know that? And the real reason is your son or daughter is addicted to something that highly likely if they take the pill that has too much fentanyl, you'll be needing to know how to do this. And that wasn't the first time. We've, we've also did a training four or five years ago that the next day that same Narcan was used and saved a daughter. And uh, it's five years later and that person is out living in, in California, managing a house, still alive, making a difference in the world. Um, 107,000 people died of addiction last year. Um, you guys are all grappling with help. You, you know, labor, how do we do it? The shortage, how does a town hire? And we're all wondering where all these people went. One million people working age people in the last 20 years are gone to addiction. And, uh, and I think we also forget about the parents that, that can't work anymore because they lost their kid. They're just not the same. Um, th those are numbers that we have to start putting together and, and we're doing it. Um, and I, you know, again, I know it's a big sum of money and sounds like a big sum of money. The 22,000 sounded like a lot, uh, but we spent about $60,000 this year on sober living al right alone just in that roughly. I throw out numbers and they get mad at me because I'm not exact because I don't remember them. But again, we paid, uh, that's our budget. And we've been relying on businesses for that money for the last seven years. And we, you know, I, I think that when we have an opportunity to have money and what it's intended for is the remediation, which is a very large word. Uh, we are all about remediation and ev everything we do and every step we take. Just in the month of January this, this month, we've already paid out $9,000 in um, sober living. If you look at the, the two uh, pie charts that I have, it talks about CSO Groton intakes, and we did 182. 139 of them are Groton residents. And I want to kind of break that down for you, because when we say they're Groton residents, we obviously have Stonington Institute right here in Groton. Most of those individuals go into Stonington Institute homeless. So once they've been there for six weeks, do you, they walk out the door, they don't have anywhere to go. So out of those 139 of Groton residents, there were 136 of them were homeless. 
and we were able to partner with Sewington Institute, they call Linda a lot, and if they're willing to the, make the next step to the continuum of care of their recovery, we're, we're able to subsidize them to get into sober living. And just to point out, for sober living, we realized when that became uh, a very, I think I heard about, so I was a social worker before at the hospital. When I heard about so sober living, it was about 10 years ago. Um, we then realized there was an issue with sober living because they were really more of flop houses more than sober living. And so then we went on a journey of kind of um, making that, uh, providing education, understanding what the best practices were for sober living. So the places that we send people, we're knowledgeable. We know them. We know that they've gotten the certification. We know that they know what best practices are. So um, these are not like a mom and pop that, you know, a mom and dad that just sees, oh, well, so-and-so says that they have a sober living and they might put them in a place that might not be in their best interest. Um, so I just want to let you know that there's background being done to each one of, to each place that we place people in. I think sober living was a scary, almost like a swear word, a sober house. And when we first got involved, for a lot of people, it was. And, and even for us, we felt we dropped some. We we have met and brought cigarettes to people and food, and and you'd walk in the house and the curtains were hanging off, and it was just horrible place to look. And that's when when we started doing the certifying and working with them. Uh, it's just not not what you think it is anymore. They're part of the solution. They're not just part of it. I would say they're a majority of it. These folks come out and they're they're being held to standards inside that house, living with people who've been through it. They call them the best liars on the planet, but I, I say that we're the best listeners. Um, they don't, they give themselves too much credit. They're, they're, list, they're lying to their parents and their parents are believing them because they want to. When they end up at a sober house, they work, they're living in amongst people that have been through it. Uh, and it's just a lot of accountability there. And it's just been the way that we've been able to help, but there's better ways and bigger ways we can do it. And that's why we're here asking uh, for you guys to support us. And I do want to remind the council that there's a reason why Community Speaks Out was here in Groton. Because from day one, when we brought the Chief Campanella from Gloucester, Massachusetts to Fitch High School, it was our police department that signed on first to PARI program in our area. And has continued to work with us about maybe not so much arresting somebody, but to getting the help. Um, we are, one of our goals that I wanted to point out, and it's in your packet, and you can review it, and we're pretty much almost there. Um, is to becoming really put, putting us on the map to becoming a recovery friendly Groton. And when we look at this list, we've checked off most of this on this list. So we're not far off from becoming a recovery friendly Groton. And along the top, if you wonder what does that do for Groton, it will let you know the benefits. I really encourage you to read the benefits, what it does to Groton on the very top will tell you what the benefits are to become a recovery friendly Groton. And we also, the other thing that these monies would be used for is sometimes when people are in addiction and they've been in addiction, they might be sober, but it's also about the habits that they've created along the way and changing those. We were, you know, the Super Bowl just happened. There's not a lot of sober places where you could go and watch the Super Bowl. We're about, we want to create environments where it's healthy through activity um, so that they're not repeating the same behaviors over again. So that's another place where that money would be used. And I'd, I'd like to, to, if there was any questions that you guys may have for us, because uh, we, we could talk about this forever. Yes. Because yeah. we, we've been living it for the last seven years, but yeah. Thank you. I just want to thank you um, for uh, coming tonight to educate us on this topic, um, as well as uh, all the work you do for the community. Um, um, so I, I, I just want to say I'm supportive of allocating this money tonight. It, it's not on the agenda to allocate the money tonight. Um, so uh, if we can, but it's, there's no motion prepared. So I just want the council to, to, to understand that um, we can choose to do this tonight or we can choose um, to postpone. Um, I would just support, I, I think this is the best way to allocate the money. Um, we gave them the first round of, of, of 
of funds. I believe that they, they spent those dollars better than any other organization. They are in a position to spend the dollars better than any other organization. Um, so I won't make the motion just in case um, other counselors uh, uh, are not ready to allocate this money at this time. However, I just want to express um, my support for, uh, for allocating the money to this organization. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Kasiri. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I imagine because you are a local nonprofit that a significant amount of your time goes towards fundraising. Can you go over the percentages of how much time is taking raising the money rather than going towards providing services? This, this past year, I would say we did our gala, our, our third and last. <laughs> but the, the board is a working board, and uh, it was just an incredible undertaking, incredibly successful, incredibly great, you know, a lot of we got good energy from it uh, but the ultimate end is when you're when you're always thinking about where you're gonna get your next dollar I'm, I've been fortunate enough to work for a company that's donated ten thousand dollars every year for the last three years that kind of starts our year off in a good direction Holmgren Subaru uh, our biggest business donor uh, program uh, for the last three years was the other big guy and believe it or not Facebook and online donations from individuals was our biggest donor um, so it, it says a lot, and when, you know, the churches, they all donate to us. Um, really, it, it, the proof is when people think of you, I think, okay. that you do not. Yeah. And one of our other biggest donors, which we hope never to get another dive for, are funerals um, in lieu of. Um, and so we wouldn't, you know, that would be a place where we would like to not get money from. Absolutely. And so, so receiving some funds would help you guys in, in reaching your goals without having to worry about where the next dollar is coming from, correct? Yes. Yeah, okay. but it would help, definitely. Um, we just don't want to over, we've, we've really reached out to our community for a lot of help, and we want to be able just to continue to help our community in that way. Um, we are outgrowing our office right now, mm -hmm. and we just want to have a safe place for people to come and, and have a place to come and ha have that conversation with the a navigator that we actually are going to be getting with Reliance. They are going to be giving us one um, partnership with us. So, yeah, we would. It would really do, It would really take a lot of burden off because, like, our our budget is about a hundred thousand dollars, and so it would be able to let us expand. Great. Um, with more funds, could you expand your roles in the schools? Absolutely. We actually. I'm glad you asked that question because we actually just sat down with the superintendent of schools because we have sent out a mass letter to Southeastern Connecticut, to all the schools. And our, you know, we will um, fund speakers to come out. And we always talk about, we don't wanna be the agency that goes up with the PowerPoint. That's just not who we're gonna be um, with all the statistics up there. We need, we're about human connection. We're about human connection every day. So when we have someone go up to our schools and speak about the journey, it's a hard conversation, but I'll tell you the emotion that comes out of the room um, is amazing. And so our next event is actually Lyme Memorial. We're going to be go speaking, we'll be speaking there on um, the 23rd of this month. But Groton has asked us if we would be willing to consider bringing a program right to the school that's been talked about. So we're kind of, you know, they've been left with a bunch of information. And I wanted to touch upon the play that we did that we came up with is one of the things we found very, very difficult. And this is a, a, about us problem solving. When we see there's a need, and we go to a school and we talk to the kids, and at night we have this forum, and five parents show up, and they're the ones that need to be in the room too. We said, how do we get those parents to the room? We came up with the idea of a play, because if it's student-led, and they perform a play, and at night they do a performance, what parent isn't gonna come watch their kids perform, right? So these are the ways we problem solve to say, what is the need? And how can we get people to the table? How can we get people in the room? Yeah, and we've been working very closely, even with with um, gas. But we've been working very closely and very proud of the group that just started at last year um, at Grosso Tech, and you'll see it on your thing. That it's Students for Recovery, and they're amazing. Um, they want a mental health um, room for their kids. They want. So we were able to kind of like come on board and say, what do you need? And it was a simple ask of shirts to identify them as safe peers that people can go up to and say, I'm having a problem. So they got all their t-shirts. We helped organize um, an event in Quantic Plains. 
asked other agencies to come join, and it was a really successful event, and we are gonna be doing that again this year, um, April and May. Sorry. Thank you, that's amazing. Um, I'm so glad that you brought up the fact that Community Speaks Out is constantly adapting and adjusting because when I was in law enforcement, fentanyl wasn't even a thing. And now it is, you know, uh, obviously changed significantly. Um, so is there any kind of cost to the education of your board members or any of your volunteers for the constantly adapting and changing atmosphere of the drug world? I, th I think this, the, the reason is not a cost for our education as a board is we go to our meetings and we have these perfect, we just, we just got a new board member, Mike Doyle, um, and he's just, he's the guy that's, that's, that has been in addiction himself and, uh, and he's in recovery. Uh, so we learn from each other, we learn from each other's mistakes. <laughs> Um, a lot of the advice we give, and I give folks advice all the time, it's like, if it doesn't seem like it fits perfect for you, then that's not the right advice for you. We all know that, you know, it, I feel like in, in that letter, uh, he said he feels like, the person that wrote that letter said, he, the parents said he feels like he has a PhD in, 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 uh, in addiction. addiction. Yeah. Uh, and the reason that is, is because you're so close to it, and you listen and hang on to every single word. Uh, we have parents that come in and have, a guy will go up or a girl and tell their story and they'll ask them what time of day they got sober or if was it the summer or the winter they're trying to make that path exactly the same for their child or, or help them and we know the answer to that that every single person's path is different uh, and that's why i think it's 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 an education yeah. it's a learning process i would day. like to add to that because he doesn't always do all the finances in the house but uh <laughs> linda and i myself have gone and gotten some education and we do pay out of our pocket for those, and we just saw one again that's going to be really, you know, beneficial to us that we're talking about going to in April. And most of the time, we've paid out of our pocket for it. Um, so we take our vehicles and we drive to um, wellness events, and we never gas up our cars. So that's just the the commitment that we have in the community to do. So yeah, we do pay for it, but it's usually out of our own pocket. Understood. And I imagine that there would probably potentially be a cost of updating your literature, of updating your programs. So I'm assuming there is a cost as, you know, as the world is adapting. Yes, absolutely. There's a cost to actually just, you know, doing business, but there's no cost in we don't have any paid employees. So um, the money that we use is directly given to the consumers, um, to our to the people that we want to help. Understood. Um, and the last time you guys came before us and spoke to us, you um, explained to the council about the cost of sending someone to rehab. Yeah. Um, can you go over some of your other costs, like supplies or anything that this money would benefit you? Well, we, we do have a youth group. So we're trying to, we, what we do forget about is all the folks that lost, but that we have lost, mm -hmm. that there's a, there's a casual, there's a, you know, people behind that loss, parents, um, we suffer, uh, but the, the, the children, uh, they need a safe space too. And I think the budget for that group, the youth group, was I think in around five or $10,000 this past year. I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but that's going directly to youth. And what they do is they meet once a month at our place. Um, the other cost is obviously our rent. You know, we've been renting that building, so we have the heat and, and utilities. Uh, most of our cost is, is sober living. Right. And continues to be that. And it's, it's kind of a moving target because th there's months where we'll help 10 or 15 people or 20 people. And then the next month, you, it's 100. It's because it all depends. Sometimes it's winter, sometimes around holidays. Um, we're starting to get that data every single year and starting to be able to build on it to know yeah. that when, when your busy time is. But the bigger thing is, is that we only have so much pot of money. So it is right. going towards, you know, sober living and, and crisis mode and things like that. But yes, we we have expenses when we want to do sober programming. Um, if we want to do any kind of interventions, trainings, we do. Um, there are meetings that they will give uh, a stipend to somebody to do um, healing or those type of things. Those are all cost. But we know that we only have so much money. So we try to live within our, our means. Uh, with money, we would be able to broaden that. Absolutely. Um, and would you be able to expand your um, your reach and your frequency of Narcan trainings? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's, the, that's the plan. And also have Narcan on hand is a goal of ours. Um, Narcan, um, 
sometimes we have to go to different agencies, they don't have it, people come to us and often ask it, we would like to be able to have that on hand. Mike Doyle, wish he could have been here. He's on our board and he, he's the one who gave the Narcan training that night. And his goal in Norwich is every bar, every restaurant, every public bathroom, he wants it in there, saves lives. It's a good thing to do. And uh, that's one thing we can't, it's a hunt. We looked it up because we were wondering if we bought it. And I saw it online for $185 for a two pack dose. That, that gentleman that we're talking about that was saved last week was, had took five of them. So it was almost $800 worth of Narcan for one person, which how much would you pay for your son or daughter to live? It wouldn't really matter to you. Um, but that's, that's our goal. Great, and I think that's important to get that figure out there of how much it actually costs to distribute that out to the community. Um, Tammy, you went over the Navigator program. Could you explain that to those that don't know the program and how beneficial it is to the community? Oh yeah, it's absolutely beneficial. Um, a trained um, Navigator is actually, the one that we're getting here at Groton for a few days a week, is actually walked in someone's shoes. They're actually in long-term recovery. And so I can tell you the difference between someone talking to their therapist or someone like me who's not in recovery might be able to, you know, get a lot from me. But when it comes to speaking to someone who's walked in their shoes, it's such a larger benefit. There's a different conversation. There's a better outcome. Um, and it's so imperative. And I, I can see like a goal in our future is to see that they can be helpful to our police departments, to our social workers, to actually, we're all about connectivity, not just to people in recovery, but just to the organization, you know, the whole town. We need to be starting to bridge, create bridges within our own town to make sure that everyone's connected. And that's the way that things get solved in Groton is be, being connected. And when, when that navigator does intervene, that's one less intervention that your police force, your fire, your EMS um, has to do. Uh, and it's a, it's a benefit that's an unseen benefit. I mean, it's hard for us to quantify that. It's always hard, right? When you, when you, well, sometimes when you spend money and do the right thing, you guys, you do it all the time up there. You vote on things that are good items. And it's, God, I didn't get the metric from it. How many people did we actually help? Um, we're getting to see how many people we helped. And we know, and if it's that one person that didn't get arrested that one night, uh, or, or even seeing the police officer's face when we go tell them that that person that you narked in last year five times is in California living their best life and doing great, and you're showing pictures of this person. That benefit, the psychological benefit for our first responders to see that recoveries happen, and those are the connections that we really make that are that are priceless. Great. Is there any cost associated with bringing the navigator to Groton? Not right now to us. Um, it looks like we're partnering with. Um, Reliance in Norwich and they have gone for grants so they're awesome to bring her we had our first meeting and she's very excited the only cost would be that she was she'll be using our space which will be a safe space for her to be able to meet with families in Groton and for those who are struggling she would use our space so it's kind of a win-win for us with more money would you be able to potentially bring more navigators in I, I think I think a lot of it is space wise. So yep. we have our meetings every every third Wednesday. Somebody somebody has a meeting every single week. Then we have somebody that does hula hoop and we have some we we've actually yep. there's a bunch of people that use our office. Yep. Uh what we were thinking of is if we're a little bit bigger, really what we'd like is that recovery navigator at any time of day or night to be able to walk into there and meet a family. Tammy and I used to have people at our house. It's not a good setting. You know, parents are upset. They're, they're, they just found out you, you think your kid's going to die. You want to talk for 20 hours. Uh, go into an office and making a plan and then be able to shut a door behind you and you both go home. At some, time, at some point, you get to right. leave. And uh, it's more of a professional space. And I think if we had more, uh, a, a, bigger, in a, a bigger space, sometimes the recovery rate navigators are just volunteers, a sponsor. Right. It's these people that are still yes. helping and they, they'll use the room for the same type of thing. So Melissa had made a good point when we were speaking is that we want to stay in our lane. So there are people that do these navigators and if we can piggyback with them and partner with them and provide them resources, whether it's, you know, helping them get to those sober living houses and we fund those things that will help us all work together. Um, and also, you know, having a training event 
at our office to train people that are in long-term recovery and they want to see you at least a year in recovery before you become a navigator and the way they pay back without having to pay for their education is to have to volunteer hours in your in your thing so that would be a way for us to get nav more navigators in our community and we know that people that are most successful in addiction are ones that are able to give back and so we would be able to provide them with more opportunities to give back um, and letting them kind of figure out what their path is going to be to give back. Understood. Thank you. And so potentially being able to provide that bigger space could provide more resources out to the community. Yes. Yeah, we, we kind of had our recovery, our navigators already because we use, we work with Life Happens and they have discovery mentors and we actually will fund, it's by the hour, we'll stipend that. And those are people that are in recovery. It's for life and coping skills, getting yeah. back into the community. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councilor Jones. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the, I don't know the, your name. Melissa <laughs> Ford. Melissa Ford. Okay. I didn't, if, you're, if you were from New London, you know who she was. <laughs> She's a legend. Didn't do it, you didn't do any introductions. I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> I, I am sorry. Um, so, Bruce, this is, this is, all, this is Linda Labby. Linda she, Labby. She's on the board She's with us. She's our a, treasurer. Okay. Tammy Dela Cruz. I've yeah, never seen Tammy before. <laughs> um, I just, I, I'm extremely impressed of how you have presented this and what you're doing and what you're doing to our community. It's really quite amazing. Do we, is there, are there equivalent services like yours in other communities? No, we, we would, we, our hope was when we first got started to, to make this group, make a blueprint and see if people could copy it. We knew, mm -hmm. we just don't have the energy to go. Uh, and, and I say it's Groton, but we're really all the way out in Norwich and, and New London. Like we're helping folks from all these different towns. They show up here, but um, that's our goal. And I think if, if blueprint wise, if we had a bigger space, when we, we get feedback and when people come from like a Utah and they say, you guys don't know what recovery is. Recovery is walking to something that looks exactly like a bar, but it's not. <laughs> Recovery is being able to walk, go to a baseball field and not have everyone drinking. And yeah. that's, that's like a real recovery area where they'd say, this is a recovery area. And that's what we're looking to make possibly. And maybe be the blueprint for this area. I know CCAR does something very similar, but where else would you go play pool <coughs> if you, unless you were drinking? Where, like, where would that happen? And what does that look right. like? And I think that's what we're, and, and this, we talked about this as a board before we came because this is my vision, but I think we're all collectively getting there because we're saying, what do we need? And a lot of it is just connection to people. So when they go to play pool that night because they don't want to go to another meeting, now they're just going to say, I'm playing pool with a guy that's also in recovery. That, that conversation is very organic, but they don't feel like they're in the middle of a meeting. They're just being regular people. Uh, and that's what my son struggled with. How do, how do I be regular? and be 24 years old and not be drinking at a bar. To that's your, what regular 24 year olds To answer do. your question, I think the only other one that I know that's kind of close to us, but they don't have the as broad of, uh, is uh, Matt's mission, and that is in, in Griswold, Connecticut. So but I think it's, a, gee, unfortunately a it's a huge benefit to our community that we have to have this, but it, we have a service that's right here that's connected to the community and we can do it. Can I just, I didn't, um, on this chart, was it 182? total and out of that you're 139 or yeah or, or those two numbers get added together so no 182 it's a bad intakes graph. sorry we um 182 <laughs> intakes we did in 2022 okay and then and that's just with people in recovery we really haven't gotten to capture we talk to family members every day and we could be on the road talking to family members and we should probably do a little bit more capturing of just the family members but it's really hard to to separate that because right. it's really together but it's not you know what i mean so or sometimes that's, those in, are just definite intakes that are gonna get resources your intake may be just a phone call that's somewhere and not a sort of a formal yeah and that's more, not included on that so right. it's, the numbers a lot more right, and as you read more. the in, the uh, testimonial from that family there was four hours spent on new year's day and when they were in crisis mm -hmm. that was just one day so that family was like over a week of just non-stop but he is doing wonderful and just got a job full-time job i mean i can walk into any of these sober houses at any time knock on the door we actually had a death in one of our sober houses which was a medical emergency it was not an overdose and community speaks out went and we shopped just like you would any time if you had a death in your family and we knocked on your door and gave you you know some food and and provided you and that's what we did we walked up to the sober house we sat down with them 
we brought them food. Um, and the first thing that was mentioned was that the police department had been there and they, have, were, sh they were just not used to being treated so nicely in that sober house. Where in other areas, um, not in Groton, but other areas had felt that accusatory, that the, the attitude was different. In Groton, because we are so connected when it comes to this crisis, I feel like they learned so much and they were treated with the utmost respect and compassion that they should be treated with. And I, I think any group that we <clears throat> talked to about rewriting our blueprint and showing people what we did, it was getting buy-in from the police. It was making sure that they knew, sharing the recovery though. Like I, my, I used to think, God, if, if someone told you they'd pay you a hundred grand a year to dig a hole right next to the shore, and then every morning you went back and it was filled in, how hundred grand was good, but your whole life seems useless. And that's how the police and first responders were feeling. And then we started going to their, their turnovers in between shifts and just giving them stories about people that are doing good. And, and their attitude changed about, you know, okay, I'm not just picking this person up, throwing them in a bus to do it again next week. And then they met the parents and know that they saved somebody's child. And that's, that's the connectivity that we talk about, that we're doing. And uh, that's part of the blueprint that we're hoping that we can, it's hard to encapsulate that and write it all in a, like a manual. But, uh, to, but that's right where we started. It seemed like we, we were forced to start that way because nobody was listening to us at first. And then once somebody got up there with a badge and, and was standing in front of the stage and said, okay, we're dealing with this wrong, it changed the conversation. I do want to say you talked about our library. We thank God for the library because yeah. they hosted us for a long time with our meetings and it was great. But there was an individual that couldn't find the library. They weren't from in the town. And they pulled a police officer over and said, I'm trying to find no, community. Knocked on his door. Knocked on his window there. while he was sitting there and asked for a commu the Community Speaks Out um, meeting. And he didn't know where it was. But he got on, the, on his radio. He found out pulled and over. pulled the person over to tell them where to go. I mean, that, they know that's how important it is for them to get to those support group meetings. So, so I just, I don't want to take no, this too much longer. I, no, I just want to thank you for everything that you're doing and, and and Joe, I've known you for a while now and, and the contributions you made as a state rep, but I think you, this is where your real contribution is going to be and the, the difference you're gonna to make to this, the community here and to the people here is be much more effective than all the great things that you did at the State House. It's yeah. here where it, you're gonna save people's lives and do no, things. We, I so, love it. Yeah, so I would, I would just echo um, Mayor Melinda's support of this money also going to to you guys i think it's worthwhile and i think you're good stewards of it and you're doing an unbelievable service in the community so thank you Councilor baumgartner uh yes i'd like to make a motion okay uh, i'd like to make a motion um to uh allocate the year two distributor payment of twenty three thousand three hundred ninety eight dollars and twenty eight twenty three cents uh to community speaks i'll second Motion made by Councilor Bumgarner, seconded by Melendez. Uh, $23,398.23 allocated to Community Speaks Out. Yes. All right. Would you like to speak to your motion? Yes, please. Uh, first and foremost, uh, thank you all for uh, coming out this evening. I know it's getting late and you've been waiting for uh, some time, um, but uh, uh, this was really incredible information. Obviously, you know, you um, can put you know, numbers on a paper, but um, it doesn't beat the stories you can share. And, um, you know, every time you've come to this council, uh, Tammy, uh, Joe, uh, Linda, and, um, and now uh, Melissa, great to see you uh, too. Um, you know, you have illustrated the real impacts in the community. And um, it's so important that we hear that without, you know, those face-to-face -face conversations with folks that are a part of our community, you're saving lives in the process. And that, that's what, you know, Community Speaks is, um, is, is all about. And um, just um, seeing how you've already spent those dollars in such a proactive way um, since we made that initial year one allocation uh, just makes, uh, makes sense to me. Um, I do also know that um, recently we did learn that we'll be re uh, we were awarded the uh, Jensen manufacturer payments. Um, tonight on the agenda, um, I was 
prepared to learn a little bit more about how we ought to allocate those. So um, I would, the reason I did not include that in the motion is because um, we um, we still need to figure out exactly what, what we can expend those uh, dollars for. Um, the year two distributor um, payments reflects the uh, first year uh, distributor payments that came from the uh, multi-billion dollar settlement um, for, that included multiple uh, companies. Um, and uh, as uh, a state, Due to the leadership of uh, William Tong, uh, was a signatory of that uh, lawsuit. Therefore, um, the state was able to uh, receive uh, uh, millions of funds, and Groton uh, stands to benefit uh, significantly from that for, I believe, the next. Um, so we're near two, it's a 13 year uh, allocation. So uh, either 13 or 30. 18. Uh, 18. All right, that's somewhere in between. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, but nonetheless, um, you know, in, in the case that those funds uh, need to be tapped into, they would be there. Um, and obviously, we, we have a great partner already identified in, in Community Speaks. So uh, this would continue that. Um, it almost mirrors that same allocation the last time around. And so uh, uh, just one other point. Um, in the past, as a council, we have deliberated about, you know, uh, what you know, we rely so much on volunteers, but again, this is a volunteer job. We, we can't literally rely on you to do this. And as much as we appreciate you, you know, doing this, um, you know, uh, it's still, I think, a, a feature of town government to do something as well. And so in, in the past, this council has talked about maybe establishing a um, recovery uh, specialist uh, position um, within the human services. There has been t some talk amongst the council if that should be ought to be housed in the police department. So that's something also to bear in mind too in the case we want to uh, establish such a position or, or create something internally to have Once those resources readily available. I apologize. Um, thank you. Thank you. Council Bordelon. Uh, thank you. Um, so my first question, I guess, is uh, first, thank you for coming. And I obviously think it's a worthy, worthy cause as a person who has worked uh, in masses with probation assistance and worked with um, HIV positive women who were uh, previously drug addicted or had husbands or, sp or partners that were drug addicted. And then they became secondary infected, not knowing the partner had an addiction problem. So thinking of the women and the children. And, uh, um, Due to the advancements of a lot of medications, HIV and AIDS you know, can be is, is a livable disease now. Um, definitely don't want it, but it is livable. Um, and as we know, a lot of children can be born without it. Just because a parent is positive, we know that the child may not become. And so that was work. I've worked with a lot of barriers in making sure that the moms that are HIV positive um, were able to understand how transmission occurred and was able to make sure that that you know post uh, you know delivery you know, delivery that they were not going to ever have a situation where they could contaminate. Uh, or, or, or pass on the virus. Um, and then here locally serving on the you know, Community Support Services Board where you know, we have girls that are committed to the state of Connecticut that come from you know, addicted families or were born addicted. Um, so it's just uh, fentanyl, you know, looking from the DCF perspective, you know, the, 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 the object of them was to return the children back to families and with the new crisis of drugs uh, that are out there, a lot of children are not going back. There's just, the recovery is not happening on some levels like it used to. Um, because the drugs are much more potent. I'm really familiar with Narcan. I'm Narcan trained. You know, we use it at the hospital where the, the, the other places I've worked at. Um, and yeah, I've seen and heard stories where people, like you stated, have had to have Narcan multiple times um, until a responder shows up with extra. Um, I agree with allocating funds. I think it's locally, but I'm also concerned with allocating too much funds to one particular agency because you guys can only do so much and there's only, there's so many people in the community so I just want to see funds evenly distributed because if you guys hit a wall and don't have help, the secondary place needs those funds as well. So I just don't think it's not a good thing to put all funds and resources into one sole agency. As I'm very thankful that the Groton Community Speaks is part of our agency and I have been part of the, and during COVID I did the online gala, uh, gala before and auction, I think I got a little basket with some souvenirs, which was wonderful. And so I, I understand the work you guys do. Um, so that's my question. The other question I have is for the town manager. Um, it, can we allocate based on this, the, what we have written in our packet? Mm -hmm. we, we can't hear you. Can't hear you? No, you're not muted. Well, it says recording paused. Yeah. Mm, why is the recording paused? I 
to sell my stuff on the end. They can hear each other, it seems like. <laughs> They've been making fun of us this whole time. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Okay. Uh, back to could you. The way the uh, that last part of the thing reads is council will discuss acceptance of these funds and the methods to allocate current and future funds. Um, the method can be to give two. <laughs> I, I think it's reasonable. Recording in progress. Oh. <laughs> okay, because it's just the way it states to me, um, it's, it's, states that we're going to discuss how we're going to allocate. Um, how come we didn't bring any other agencies around the table to ask for allocation? What was the outreach like? Uh, the mayor asked me to invite um, the, the uh, community speaks out. Uh -huh. There was not any effort on my part to do anything. So just one? Yeah. So again, again, I, I have to stand at a fair. There's other agencies that I know people have gone through your program and been very successful and then one time couldn't maybe get help and then they had to go to somewhere else late at night or they didn't, you know, we got to make sure we're not just fortifying one without making sure these are distributed evenly. So it's nothing again. So tonight we're looking at how much to allocate town manager. Again, I mean, you have up to the, uh, the $112,907.06. And I guess a point of information for the mayor, uh, man, uh, mayor. Mm -hmm. how much were you saying that you support? What were you, you didn't use a number, as, as I was curious, what were your I thoughts on a number? Um, I could support allocating the whole amount. I understand if others don't want to allocate the full amount and they just want to allocate what we allocated in the first year. I'm comfortable with either. Okay, because uh, I know at the last meeting, again, I just encourage that we invite everybody around the table so everybody can like, like the ARPA funds should be able to apply. I said at the last meeting when we allocated the 20 something thousand, again, to make it fair to every agency that supports this problem, we're very lucky to have you guys. I think you guys do great things. Uh, I just think this is like, and I know, Joe, you, you, did you work on this at the Hartford level on this bill, like with the thing? No, this was a, a federal lawsuit. Federal. Yeah. No, I didn't know if you had any more insight to add to Comes it. Like, time how it's expired. It's allocated. Is Am I able to speak? I'd like to ask you, what other agency do you know that is totally volunteer? My able to respond? Um, sure. Yeah. Briefly. Um, these, and I respect that, mm -hmm. the volunteer side. This doesn't say to go to only volunteer. There's other programs like Sharp, you know, Sharp in New London. There's a ton of programs that have detox beds right there immediately that, that could use some funds too. I, I, I respect the volunteer side, but our, our order here is not just volunteer. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure like the detox beds in the area and other places that do similar work um, have a chance to be funded. So I just, I don't feel comfortable allocating the whole amount thank to you. one agency. Thank yeah. you. So thank you. And I can respond if that is, is that okay? Yeah. Um, and I, I see where your caution is. Yeah. I, I, to, I totally it's understand you, you're, you're allocating funds. For us in the group that and, and what, our, what we're envisioning, we were thinking of the whole 112,000 in our head because if we're really going to make an impact and a difference, the 10,000 to 20,000 at a time really um, it's not allowing us to make decisions to to get a bigger place. You know, getting $20,000, we just said $9,000 last month for for sober living. Uh, we're we're not quite sure we'll get exactly the same money from from Hillary next year or from so to me. And I get it. Being in the position you guys are at, once you make a decision and you vote on it, and you know somebody would say, "Well, how did you just choose that one?" And I get, I get digging down. I listen. I, I, I I've been in the seat that you're in, um, and and we would welcome uh, other folks coming up. We would welcome, you know, making sure that we were spending the money in the in the correct way. Uh, we we really do feel like we've made the impact, and we feel like we could take that money and change the way recovery looks in Grant and. Uh, with a, with with the full allocated amount, we were also hoping that we could have that even stretched out over the years. And, and again, uh, when we sit in front of a board, or if the council, a future council, wanted to call us and, and get an update, that we would. 
that at any moment, at a drop of a hat, we also welcome any of the council members to come to our meetings to see what's happening. And again, I, oh, I'm sorry. And I guess I was asking that question not to challenge, but to really make you understand that the money is going directly to clients. It's not going towards salaries of any sort. It's not only just about getting a bigger space, but it's also about growing. One of the things that we did identify is, is that h homelessness in unemployment. It's not unemployment because people can't find jobs, but it's also being able to deal with the stressors that they have in their life and being able to work around them. We would like to grow the program, but we can't do it without money and we can't do it without resources. So that that's that's where we were going with that. I just have a point of information. Um, well, we'll move on to Councilor Franco. Can I just ask my point of information really quick first? What's your point of information? Um, I guess, uh, why didn't we invite other agencies just to have a fair representation? So uh, the council doesn't have to allocate money tonight. So if, if you wish to hear from other agencies before you decide to allocate the money, yeah. um, you can certainly. I mean, if they don't um, come, they don't come. I mean, but. Yeah, yeah. Okay, just think you can certainly it. wait, um, uh, uh, abstain. If, if other counselors feel like they're ready um, to allocate the money tonight, if a majority does, then the, the money will be allocated tonight. Right. It, it's just a decision of, of the oh. council. All right, because I just was, because the time interest said it was the, the, the mayor's decision to only invite this group, so I just didn't know why we didn't extend the arm a little further, that's all, just to fairly have everyone sell, sell their pitch. Yeah. Thank we did you. for Harper Funds. Thank you. That's a fair representation. Thank you. Council Franco. Okay. Thank you. Um, one of my criteria when we discussed it last time was to find an organization that is not private based or a actual business um, where they're, you know, their goal is basically to make money. Um, it also was not to find an, or an organization that is funded by the state because the state has deep pockets. Mm -hmm. And if you're fully funded by the state and you're not a money, you can ask the state for more money. And if you're, your budget's tapped and you want to start a new program, you ask the state for more money and they'll most likely give it to them. So you are not fully funded by the state government. I'm sure you get some grants here and there, but you are not funded by the state of Connecticut. Is that correct? Correct. Um, Mr. Burt, are you there? Yes. So it was said tonight that the Jensen manufacturing manufacturer payment that we're not sure about how it has to be used. Is that correct? It's the exact same, it's the exact same guidelines. It's the exact same guidelines? Mm -hmm. All right. And um, do you know of any other organizations in Groton that sort of fit the criteria I've been discussing um, that's not fully funded basically by the state and is not a private organization or a business? Do you know of any other organization in Groton? No. I, I don't. Sorry. To any of you? No. No. All right. Very quickly, can you, I have been, I would just like to say thank you for everything you do. I have witnessed your work firsthand, even planting flowers and having your organization bring people to us that were doing community service and you helped. Um, I was with Joe planting some flowers <laughs> and somebody came up who was having a crisis and I was there with an, an RTM member and Joe just sprung into action and took care of the situation and I honestly was at a loss of what to do at the moment. And I'm very thankful that you were there. Um, I've watched what you do on social media and all the events that you're, you're putting on. Um, bowling, you know, dances, karaoke, um, Narcan training. I mean, there's all kinds of things. I see you're very, very active. Can you explain to me what, um, while I've also been around you, Tammy, um, your phone rings in all the time. And um, you've explained to me recently about 211. Can you explain that? Um, yeah, 211 has, uh, the community speaks out. So if someone calls in crisis or someone is looking for some help for addiction, um, they're given community, my number from community speaks out. And then you help with what you call sometimes intake, and I don't understand what intake is. Can you so explain intake that? process is collecting their name, their date of birth, um, their ethnicity, a lot of things that we need um, in case we have to go for a grant to keep going. If we run out of fu um, you know funds, 
we try to get some small grants, but it's a little hard for a smaller organization. But um, yeah, we collect a lot of da data and a lot of that too is phone numbers. And so the plan is to try to just you know outreach back to them, see how they're doing, um, you know, email addresses so that we can email them events that's going on in our community. So there's a lot of stuff that we collect on those intakes. And we also, you know, it gives us, you know, data on how much is opioids the problem and how much is alcohol the problem, what's going on so that we can adapt to what people need. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have, I mean, this was on our agenda before. We've had months, months to probably think about this, which I have over that time period. Um, I'm also in favor of making a decision and probably putting these proceeds to the best place. And I've heard other people discuss, like, I'd like to see other people at the table, and, but we've all had opportunities to be able to bring people to the table and to offer those, those suggestions um, and do our research and homework as um, others have. So I personally would like to see as an amended motion on the table. Make an motion. Yes, um, make an amended motion to take this year's allocation and for Community Speaks Out and future um, allocations to go to your organization with the criteria that you come back to us and give us updates on an annual basis. Second, Jones. Okay. Um, hold on, let me just. So you're allocating the $112,907 and the, the future year allocations as well? Yes. Okay. So is it all of them or is there the years? All of them. Okay. Uh, moved by Franco, seconded by Jones. Just a point of clarity uh, mm -hmm. for the town manager. Can we appropriate future funds if we don't know what those are? Kasiri. Again, just to clarify, there is no other agencies that are equivalent to you in the area? No. No. Um, and are there any other agencies solely based out of Groton? Not that are, that are not private. Um, you know, Sarnington Institute is a private entity. Right. You know, or they, state funded. Or for state profit. funded, yeah. Um, so I, I completely agree with you that you have made the impact in our community. I will be supporting this tonight. Um, and I just want to remind people that the money is not going to Community Speaks Out. It is directly going back into the community to help people that are suffering from addiction. Thank you. Councilor McBride. Thank you. I first off want to say thank you for everything you've done. Your passion, your commitment, your devotion is, is unparalleled. Um, the work that you do not being paid is commendable enough to the efforts that you've done. So thank you so much for everything. Um, I did have a question for the town manager though, and I think it's gonna be further questions now with the new motion on the floor. Because the way I, and, and I mentioned this before here at the council, I'm not a fan of, of providing money uh, for any organizations or, or hiring uh, new staff during mid-year budget years. I'm a proponent of doing things during the budget year. Uh, because that's when this council fully reviews all aspects. So I'm not opposed to the $23,000 because I think you do terrific work and I'd be okay with that. But I, my question before this motion came on was going to be, could we consider these funds because there's gonna be hundreds and hundreds of thousands of these coming over the, a great length of time that I would think this, sh this could be set up as a special revenue fund as a separate entity and those funds could come into the special revenue fund and then this, this council and future councils can handle that as an independent budget just like it does any other special revenue fund. So I would, I would like the council to consider that going forward versus the approach of having people come and, and we dole out money um, in this manner versus considering it as part of the budget process because I think that's probably our main responsibility as counselors is that budget process and I think when we sidestep that budget uh, we kind of circle around what I would consider the, one of the major uh, requirements of this council. Um, with that being said, with this motion on the floor, 
uh, I, I really can't support it. I mean, I can support it every year, giving you more and more funds, but I, I can't support, in essence, having an open checkbook for things that we don't know what's coming down the road. So, again, I fully support your organization. I just can't support an open checkbook to any organization, um, you know, for future years. So I apologize for that because I am supportive of everything you do, but I, I one of my responsibilities is to try to make sure we're managing things fiscally responsible. So I'm supportive. Um, the first motion and not the second for those reasons. Thank you. Thank you. Council Bordelon. I think, I think you, uh, Councilor McBride, uh, I, I guess if you're able to, are other towns, get, other towns are getting this funds, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, are other towns giving it all to one agency, do we know? Or, I mean, does anyone else Other know? towns are not like Grand. So like New London has several agencies that, you know, I don't know how they're gonna do all their money. But, um, May I ask uh, Council Bride, the finance director, New London? Yeah, she's correct. New London disperses it, but there's numerous other organizations right. there, so that's fair. Yeah, and we utilize those organizations as a town of Rotten. As I stated earlier tonight, uh, we do not have a shelter. Um, Absolutely. I remember bringing a friend over to be detox at Sharp one night, uh, and you know, back in the day, uh, someone called me and driving over there. There was, you know, nothing here, and you know, y you know. Community speaks. I, you know, if it's urgent, you got to get them right to get detox. You know, so I just think that we. I also agree with the open checkbook idea. I would love to give it every year too. I'm, I can support the 23. That's, um, but I do think that. What if something changes with your agency in two years? You guys realize, you know what, it's too much for me, and a whole different leadership comes with a different direction. We as a council need to be fiscally responsible and make sure you are the best agency each year. You know, right now you are, absolutely, hands down. I'm not denying that either. But I think you had a better way of describing it than I was able to from a financial standpoint. I'm just not comfortable saying, yep, every year moving forward, you guys are 100% getting every dollar that comes in. I, I can't do that without knowing what the process is. I can support the 20 something that was said, but I do think there needs to be a process where each year you guys come before us. What if a whole another agency resurrects that handles uh, a whole different form or another whole drug thing comes on the scene and a whole other approach, we want to have those funds available and then it might be okay, there's 50,000, I want to give 25 to Community Speaks and 20 to this 25 to the other agency. And you guys might be like, oh my God, we're working with them. We need them. So it's just, it's it, to be smart, you know, with the funds versus just blanketly allocating is not fiscally responsible. I think it's great that you guys were here, but it would have been great to hear what other linking agencies could be around the table. So I can agree with uh, Councillor uh, McBride. So I guess the question is for the town manager, how would we have to word that then? Uh, do which way, to do what? The Council McBride way. I was mentioning setting up. Well, a, sorry, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. Well, if you're, if you, to set up an ongoing fund, you know, you, you can say that. You could say, I will allocate this much right now into to put uh, future funds into a uh, special fund to be decided you know, on an annual basis yeah. on how to distribute. Can I speak this way? Sure. And I would say grant-wise, and I, I understand what you're saying, 18 years in a row, and, and frankly, I think an, a, a future council would be able to, to change that um, as the money came in. What we were looking for, maybe not the 18 years in a row, but if we're gonna launch and we're gonna make a commitment to get a bigger place, to expand recovery like we talked about, to have a, a fight in chance, I would say that the whole allocation this year, um, and I know you guys are going into election year, so the next council could decide not to give us the money that you decide to give us tonight. And I understand that you can't hold that money, um, but at least give us, I would say the whole amount this year. If you wanted to extend it out to two years, um, I don't think it would have much teeth in it because I think the next council may or may not have something to say about that we would absolutely want to come in front of the council every single year to report, because uh, we have had that discussion. Uh, you know, what would it look like? What, what, what if the agency, what if there was somebody else? I promise you one thing, that we do already work with all the other agencies on one level or another, uh, but that would be something that you guys could witness at a table. We could bring them with us to talk about the other agencies that work with us. So um, that's the jumping off point we're at right now, because we're in, the, we're in limbo in a lot of different ways. Uh, we're either staying in our office that we're in currently, or we're gonna make this jump and dive. And it is a dive, uh, because if you don't have the money the following year or the year after that, uh, we don't wanna get ourselves in a, in a position also 
where it all falls down. The house of cards comes down. You don't get the funding in the following year, and you've, now you've rented a bigger place and you've, you've built it up. We do want to make it self-sustaining. You guys should know that also. Uh, it's not our goal to live off the money the whole entire time. It's, the goal is to make maybe folks that use it that can't afford to, to, to pay for their Coca-Colas or whatever they do. Uh, but most of the people we deal with on a day in and day out basis, they walking with nothing. Yeah. They and, just, I, okay. and the other piece of that, I am from New London. And so I agree with you with whatever you said about using the resources of New London. I am green and gold all the way. And so I understand what you're saying, but I was hoping that with this money, we would be able to solve some of the gaps that you guys have here in Groton so that you're not always using all of the resources that you're building your own resources in Groton. Um, so how long have you guys been established? Uh, seven years. Seven years. Seven years. Um, yeah, so again, if I vote to say that it's, it's, it's not anything against, it's just my mind being fiscally conservative and you know, I, there's a chance every year you'll get it. Um, I think for me, you know, tonight, the way this is written, to be honest, I was not planning on allocating. It states like, let's talk about future allocations. So for me to come in and allocate all of it, it this doesn't state that that was necessarily, in my opinion, the way I interpret it, was going to be the plan. Because um, we didn't know about the future allocations yet. Like, we, mm -hmm. they haven't even come down, as Councillor McBride had stated. So I feel comfortable right now, today, giving that and beyond that doesn't mean I don't think you deserve it. Doesn't mean I don't support the agency. Doesn't mean I don't support the work you guys are doing. It's the comfortableness. Um, what were you guys' plan if you this funding did not become available? We just wouldn't run enough. Uh, we're not gonna go for the bigger place. I think okay. we would, we, listen, we're, we're, we're in a spot yeah. now where we're helping a lot of people and I think we're doing a lot of good. Uh, and we would stay on the same track that we are. If this money right. never came out and it was never even a lawsuit, uh, we would continue on the path we're doing. And like we have grown year by year slowly. Uh, but but to, to really jump into what we're talking about doing is going to require some investment, especially early. Uh, and that's the one thing that we would, you know, when we saw the money, the hundred and something thousand, we thought maybe that is it. Maybe that's that's the, the push that gets us. And once we have it, like I said, we, we will create some kind of where people, folks are using it. We do some folks that use our, our office now. Uh, they do give us like $50 to use the office here and there. It's little, it's little nickels and dimes that we get, but it helps us pay the bills. I do want to say something. This money has been given because there was a lawsuit. And if we want to set up a warming shelter and we want to do all that, that's going to take some time. We are in crisis in Groton. And we can't sit back and sit and negotiate and talk and talk and talk for months and months while this money sits there. Um, we need to help the people in Groton now. So I'm just trying to get, put that out there that your responsibility too is to the people in Groton. And we have a lot of sick individuals and we're, we're dealing with them every single day. And so if we want to do the best we can in Groton and make sure that we have all the resources, the time is now to do it. We don't have time of losing people every single day. And that someday we hope that it's never one of your family members. Because I can tell you, it's the worst nightmare that a family member ever lives through. But I'll tell you, there's people you know that we have helped, and they are lucky enough to wake up the next day and know their kid's still alive. So I just want to send that with you. Because we are in crisis. This should be a state of emergency. Just like if a hurricane's coming through and blasting through. This is an emergency. So I'm just urging you to honestly think very hard before you vote. Because... This is the time for us to be able to really continue to grow and make a bigger impact every single day because we are seeing true recovery right now. You may not get the, the, the impact or see the people, but I can tell you right now it's a pretty spectacular, beautiful thing when you see someone say, I got my 30-day coin, I got my one year clean, and I got a job. And that's what it's all about is making people in Groton get back into life and not be a problem in our society anymore, but actually feel good about themselves. And that, that first meeting I got, I told you guys about that I went to, and I told those three kids that I coached, I told them the Calvary is coming. I said, this is it, the Calvary's coming. In seven years, I don't feel like we got there. 
I, I feel like we have been slow stepping. And, and listen, we took our bumps and we learned a lot. I'm glad we didn't have this money thrown at us at the beginning because we would have paid for three people's recovery. That's what we would have did with it. And, and we would help three people. Um, we've been very judicious with all the dollars that we have been given and that we have raised. And, uh, and we'll continue to do that. And, and hopefully, you know, again, I, I and Portia, I'm with you, Council Portia, because I think to give it out for 18 years would probably, it, and I, the reason why on top of that is I don't think you could do it. I, I think it would be logistically, and, and I don't think you can hold a, you can't tie the hands of the future council what they want to do. But I hope to come here and to tell the next story next year to the next council. I hope to tear, I hope to keep continuing. I, I think they should, you guys should have a say in it and hear what we're doing. And if we're back here next year talking about our new building and how many extra folks we've helped and how maybe, uh, believe it or not, Homeless Hospitality Center is one of our number one partners. I've called Kathy, Tammy's called Kathy, in a bind. Like, we can't get shelter for this guy. This guy, he's using, he, nobody wants him in the sober homes, he's disruptive, and guess what? There's a respite place that Kathy finds for him. We partner with these people already. We're, 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 and, and Hillary was able to give $10,000 to the Homeless Hospitality Center too. Um, our owners have been very generous. We've had good years. Um, but they listen to, to me because they're from New York. They don't know who to donate to. And, and oddly enough, Homeless Hospitality Center has been mentioned probably 10 times tonight or 20. Uh, they're doing the work right. that we do. We're and, all together. Yeah. And also those, because we are a board the way that we're set up, we're able to be fluid. If you give the money to somebody else, they're tied just like you guys are tied. There is places where they're not allowed to go into different realms. They just refer them to another agency. We don't have to do that. We can go into those other agencies too. So that's the benefit of our board. Yeah, we meet people where they're at. We talked about a 10. We might buy someone a 10 if they had to have one. That's where we're at. We don't, it's just where we meet people exactly where they're at. And uh, sometimes it's not the most comfortable place and not the best to talk about, but that's where we're at. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Councilor Baumgartner? Um, yes. Uh, actually, can I'll defer to someone else. Okay. I'm sorry. Councilor McBride? Yeah. I, uh, I just, is there, can I make another amendment? Another motion? Is there? Yes. I, I, I would like to make the motion make a motion for to put forward $112,907.06, but not to include the future years, because I think you made some very valid points that you in essence need some money to get things started, so I get that. Um, but I do think it still should reside in this council's decision, uh, either in the budget crisis, when we know more about what next funding levels, what next year's funding level will be, to then have this council approve the amount in the future year. So that's why I'm going to end the motion. I appreciate everything you do and, and very supportive of everything you do. It's just it's a lot of money uh, and it's really a lot of money to give out for future years. So I'll suck it up. Thank you. <clears throat> motion by McBride, second by Bordelon, $112,907.06. Would you like to speak to your motion? No, I just put it ready. Thank you. All right, thank you. Councilor Baumgartner? Yes, uh, my question was going to speak to um, preventing what I uh, saw coming down the pike just with, with this council. So I, I will be very, very much enthusiastically supporting um, this allocation. And um, I do want to clarify, though, with uh, Councilor McBride, you made mention of uh, like establishing a, not a non lapsing fund, but a special re revenue fund. Yeah, a special revenue fund. Or John Burt would know best how he wants to set it up, but just a separate designation that this council would have the approval for specific usage of the opioid funding of the funds. Okay. Is that is that uh, manager Burt? Is that something that um, is permissible under, you know, under state law and I guess local ordinances and our charter? Yeah, I just, I'll just have I'll just talk with the uh, finance director. Okay, all right, excellent. And then that would uh, is that something we can do tonight, or is that something best to do in the future? Should the council elect to do so? Well, I mean, I'll just director do that anyway so unless there's conflicting direction that's what we'll do okay excellent and thank you again for uh, coming out tonight i know it's getting late thank you council franco uh town manager burt can we use this funds to offset our budget uh, only if you had money used for this exact type of thing <laughs> so in the budget so 
But I, that's what I'm asking. Can no, we, no, not otherwise, no. We can't use it because it was mentioned um, depending on what was going on in our budget. So, right. um, and yeah, then no. I'm just going to say I am absolutely not in favor of creating a special fund because that means when the funds come in, we'll be putting it into an account and not putting it out into our community where it's most needed to help the people in our community with opioid and substance abuse issues. Um, as it was stated here tonight, there's like a state of emergency going on here. I don't want to create a fund and have it sit there for years and just in case we might need it for something. I mean, we need it now. I mean, it, we don't need 18 years in a row. We need all 18 years right now and like trying to use it and really help everybody we can. Um, I understand the sentiment of let future councils decide. Future councils can decide. If we say this is who it's going to for 18 years, any council, it has been said, can come in and say, you know what? We've listened to you. We think you, we're going in a different direction. They don't have to keep giving it to you, but we're setting the stage of where it should be going. That's what I think. Um, because it can be changed at any time in the future. Just like we can go back and change ordinances or policies or anything else that's been set up in the past, we can change it. Um, nobody says it's in stone, and I also don't think it's an open checkbook. I mean, I've heard that said. It's not an open checkbook. We're not saying, here's a checkbook, go, go take all the money you need. It's a set amount. That's all there is. And honestly, as I've talked and heard you, heard you talk tonight, as much as people think it's a lot of money, it's not. Like you said, it could maybe put three people through treatment in one, in one year, right? Three people, that's it. In that's in, in, I mean, in a month. That's not a lot of money. So I get what people think that, you know, you utilize the money in special ways. I understand what you're going to be doing with it. And I, I want to keep it here in Groton. I appreciate all the outside services outside of our community, but I want it here home-based and that because what our community knows and the words out there is community speaks out and they understand where to go get help. They, the, uh, people I talk to, they don't know about the other organizations, but they've heard about Community Speaks Out. You've made your no name very well known in our community, and that's who I think people reach out to. So that's where I think 100% of the funding should go. I don't want it to sit in some special fund and then worrying about a budget line item for it because I, don't, I just don't think that's right. And it's brought up that human services may want the money. Or human, it should go to human services that counselors may want it to go there. She has been to our council meet, our meetings during the budget session, budget session, and he, she has stipulated it very loud and clear that she doesn't want this in her department. Um, she wants um, other organizations to take care of the needs because people with addiction don't go nine to five to human services for help. Thank you. What's your, what's your point of information? Um, on Councilor McBride's motion, is it? Is the uh, special fund tied to that, or is it just you're just allocating? No, the, money. the special revenue fund was a thought process to have John Hurt cons John Burke okay. consider. Okay. The motion was just the 112, just not, the 112. not okay. the continuation. Thank you, Council Borlaug. Uh Thank you. Uh, you know, I can appreciate Councilor Franco's position and passion of it, and uh, you know, I'm just as passionate, and you know, I've done the work and have lived the life of being around, you know, the population myself, you know, and so I understand what it is. But that's not why I'm up here. I'm up here to speak on behalf of everybody. I understand we are in a crisis. I see it every day. I appreciate that you're bridging gaps with the law enforcement. I mean, it's been times when people, you know, you can look at old videos in old towns. I'm not saying here in Groton, but there was probably at some point all across the country where people would be like, oh, he's back again. You know, he's a user. And they were treated unfairly, thrown in jail and treated like scum on the street because they had a drug problem. Um, you know. It's now this drug problem has bridged, you know, pain pills and, and, and fentanyl to see no color. It's getting into the top, you know, level of our communities now. And now people are listening. Before, the lower drugs was like the ghetto, the streets, the scum. And now you can have a high ranking individual that becomes addicted from these pain pills that have people have had from a surgery or knee replacement and things. So it's changing. We have to change the voice of addiction that it can affect any and everybody. So it, it does not have, where a color does not have a social class. So I'm a full supporter of it. 
But on the same token, I've sat here under ARPA funds and barely could get 120 something thousand dollars for community meals. Where was the passion then? So here I can support the 112 or whatever the I'd like a point of order on that. Sure, go ahead. What's your point of order? It's for my to the councilor's motivation my of where's everybody's quiet. passion against certain items that have already been decided at this council. Thank you. Council Borlon, you're you you are in order. Thank you. So what I was asking is is that I heard what Councillor McBride stated, and I think that's fair. You guys stated right there that you need the money to get the thing going. So that will seed the pot to get it going. And every year, it's not going to sit for a long period of time. You're going to have well in advance notice to come before us, and you're going to know better than any other agency if another one was to form. So it wouldn't sit long, and it would be allocated. I think that's fair. That's so fair to do. And, that, and it states exactly what you guys stated. That money would get the ground moving to a bigger place. I heard that. That gets the job going. But I had trouble sitting here, and we could barely get less than that sometimes for meals that help Groton residents. And I just have trouble. Like, we, we have to treat, if we're going to treat outside agencies like this, we need to treat all of it. And then other items came up for 10000 for this because this affects that and this affects that. And we, I, I, bear, I had a beg and barter from my, my standpoint, I'll speak for myself, to make sure I could move a number that would fit to feed what the asking amount for community meals. So I just ask that hunger is an addiction as well and is a, it is, is a crisis right now. So I think this number is a fair number and I think it's reasonable. I guess my question to Joe or you guys, do you guys think it's fair to come back up uh, with this money, that motion, start the process of what you asked? I, th I think what, what I would what I would want to separate is is the the meals in any other budgetary item that you would have to deal with because uh, when you when you decided to put that money somewhere else you cut something else this money is completely 100 percent allocated it was a lawsuit so it has to be spent on the remediation so you couldn't take this and say hey we want to want to open the library for one more night or we want to that's it's not made to supplement the budget so this is a little bit different i was wise. talking about arpa funds those were made yeah those those were arpa funds yeah. but you but you still but that was dividing amongst different things this is specific for one purpose and one only mm -hmm. you could divide it amongst agencies yes but it's got to be used towards opiates and i and i understand what you're saying i again i think in my head i i think what happened with Councilor franco is she was there that day and she's seen the work uh, witnessed a miracle of somebody coming out and getting help and us dealing with them and i think and the, I'm, I'm as passionate as she is about this. Um, I understand where you guys are coming from saying 18 years just sounds like a long time. I would agree. I'm, it, most people are saying that. It sounds like a, an awfully long time. Um, I, I would even like, I, I'd entertain a couple years to give us, and I know that sounds like something that maybe we'd come back anyway and explain what we did. But again, when you're coming to a jumping off point, because we're all scared up here. We don't look it because uh, we're passionate and we're talking about what our plan is. Uh, but our plan could fail miserably, and we know what the result of that that failure would be, would be uh, local people not getting the help that they need. Um, and, and do we make that jump? And I, tonight, with the vote you're talking about, the 112,000, we're making that, probably going to make that jump. But really, again, uh, if there was a second year behind it, when you can put the, 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 the expense of starting something up kind of in the back of your head and then developing you know, how you pay for it in the future, any year out helps us. Uh, and I think that's what, what Council Franco was thinking of. Uh, and, and that's where we stand. I mean, we're appreciative of anything you guys vote for tonight, believe me. Um, and we're, we're glad to share our experience with you. We would like to see more years out, but I, I understand the caution at the same time. Uh, but really, looking from our perspective, uh, if we make a jump, maybe two years, and again, maybe the next council comes in and, and they say, your, your hands are tied. But I think where, 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 where Council Franco's coming from is the next council walks in and we say, well, they gave us two years uh, knowing that you'd make that decision, but they wanted you to have some meat behind it and know why. And the why is we we're trying to establish something over a two-year period, and maybe that's why they gave them the money. So when we come in armed with the fact that a previous council was looking forward a little bit. And again, the, the money, uh, I used to... I used to think $112,000 was life-changing. And for an individual, for any of us sitting here, it is. But $112,000 when we're talking about what we're doing is really, 
and I, I don't want to demean the money. It's, what's embarrassing is how little it is, uh, how the lawsuit really doesn't address the, the pain and anguish they caused. And that's, again, we can't stop, we can't fix that part, but we can put the money to good use that they gave us. Uh, and I, again, we'll be here. Uh, we, we're not going anywhere. We'll, we'll be back here next year, same, same bad time, same bad place, to explain everything, all the wonderful things that we did do with the money that you guys allocate to them. And I think that, and just speaking to you directly, is that, Councillor, is that you're talking about access. And I understand what you're saying. You want to make sure that everybody has access. The great part about our organization is, is that if any of those organizations called us up and said, we need a new bed because we're going to put a new bed, we would pay for it. We would figure out a way to pay for it. So it's not that you're giving the money to CSO and it's going just for CSO. We collaborate with all of the organizations. We give money to them too. So I guess we are providing access. We are looking at all the different black, brown, white, LGB, their siblings, their family members. If there is a need, and if it is even one Groton resident comes to us and says, we need a need for this because I can't find that resource, we try to find it for them or we try to provide it for them. Well, thank you guys for your responses. I just think, you know, I can see where you're saying the two year would be a good, um, all of it's great. I just think to predict 18 years out is, is, is fiscally, think. fiscally irresponsible. Not, once again, not depreciating the value. Council so time's expired. The passion of the way you guys speak about what you do, my vote is sterling being fiscally responsible. It's not diminishing what you guys do. Thank you. Councilor Kassiri. Thank you. I am also as passionate as you are about this, um, and I am going to plead to one of my fellow councilors to rescind one of their motions so that I can make the motion for two years so we can get you the funding that you need to establish this, if someone would kindly rescind. Uh, councilors Bumgarner, Franco, and McBride have motions on the floor. I don't understand what the issue is with the current motion on the floor. Because it's only for one year, and I'm asking to support them for two years, like they're asking. Uh, point I, of clarification, can you guys state all the motions on the floor just to refresh since we've been going through it around and around? Thank you. The motion we will vote on first, yep. as it stands, yep. is Councilor McBride's motion for $112,907.06. That's a one-year allocation. With the account set up to no. no. Okay, we got it. The second motion on the floor is for the full year allocation, one hundred twelve thousand nine hundred seven dollars and six cents, and essentially setting a policy so that um, years going forward by default the allocation will go to community speaks out. So that's the open ended full right. And then uh, Councilor Bumgarner's motion was just for the uh, distributor payment of $23,398.28. One year. Councilor Casir, you have the floor. I'm just well, asking someone to rescind a motion because I'm hoping that we can all agree that, you know, like the Dela Cruz's have asked us that two years will at least get them to establish this raising to a hierarchy. But if no counselors are willing to do that, I will not be voting for the 112,000. I, I think there's, look, can I just ask a question? So currently it's either one year, which we would vote on first, 18 years, or 23,000. And what Councilor Kasiri is asking for is to for one of us to remove one of our motions so she can put on the floor and have it be the first vote for two years. Is that correct? Yes, I'm asking to make the 112, 907 for a two year time period. Point, point of clarification, what would the second year's like amount be? We don't know yet. Whatever is. Right. We don't know. All right. Granted so to the town of Garland. That's what I'm trying to say. It's, we don't know. We're voting on things we don't know. 
Mr. Mayor. Okay. All right. Council Casir, you have. Uh, did you give up the floor? You yield the floor. Uh, I, I yield House. the floor if Council no one Franco, is willing you to have do the so. Floor? Do you yield the floor, Council Franco? I didn't know I had the floor. Okay. I had a point of information. Okay. All right. Is there any other discussion? I will. Um, I would ask, can I have the floor for a moment? Sure. I would ask Council Baumgartner, would you please rescind your motion? Uh, Mr. Mayor. I'm the, just asking respectfully, okay. not with no disrespect at all. Well, Mr. Mayor, I would know I'm not the only person who has a motion on the floor. Uh, secondly, uh, I think it's vastly unfair uh, to be in a position to have to remove an, a, uh, a motion. Um, and quite frankly, I understand the prerogative of Councilor Kassiri, but she's asking us to make a two-year allocation. We have a motion on the floor to allocate the full amount that is already allocated to the town, the one year, the second year distributor payment and the one year Jansen uh, payment to the tune of 100, 113,000. So if it's two years, there will be a tranche of funds that will come up for that next council and Tonight, we've made no motion to do anything to create any special reserve fund for those funds. So we're going to be faced literally being in the same conversation when CSO returns for their annual, uh, their annual visit to discuss what to do with the pot of funds that we received, that we will be receiving next year. So I, I just don't understand the difference between allocating the full amount as opposed to it just it, is it for the credit? You know what? I I just don't know. Are we waiting to, to you know have somebody make the motion? I'm just trying to clarify here what what the purpose why you're trying to make a motion, um, Councilor Kizuri. Okay. okay. Are, are you asking respectfully okay, or are you accusing? Me? All right. Hold on. I'm going to take the floor <laughs> for one second. Okay. I okay. Community speaks out prefers if they can have a multiple year commitment so that they can make decisions knowing that there's some backing, that this is not just 112,000, next year they're gonna get zero. So in order for them to make bigger decisions, they'd like a multiple year commitment. I will say, okay, I'm sitting here just listening to people talk. Um, I have not, I've heard four people support uh, multiple years allocation, okay? Four loses, four does not prevail here. So if, <laughs> what I'm trying to say is it may not be possible today to get a multiple year allocation. So if you support a multiple year allocation, you may want to just vote for this first motion because if this motion fails and then the 18 year allocation fails, then we're just doing, we're on to 23,000. So that's all I want to say. Four councillors have spoken. I know some councillors have not spoken yet, but four does not win here today. So if you are interested in multiple years um, allocation as I am, just be cautious to vote down the one year allocation because it could end up being not none. So that's just all I want to say. Um, but May to I answer sense? Councillor Bumgarner's question, they want a multiple year allocation. They can make decisions um, that fit their need. May I, since Councilor Baumgartner asked me as well? Sure. Okay. First of all, I was not looking at you to rescind your motion. I asked any councilor that had any motion on the floor to rescind. So I'm, I'm not quite sure why it got pegged on you, but I was asking any councilor to rescind. Okay. Um, I agree with the sentiment of the mayor that Community Speaks Out is asking for multiple years, okay, because they would like to establish this next step for them, okay? I'm looking at this as I'm seeing a consensus that we all agree on the 112, okay? And I'm seeing that perhaps we could maybe agree to do two years rather than 18 with, if I give the, um, you know, the, they have to come and, and talk to us before they get that second year. 
but I would feel more comfortable as a council because I'm seeing that we're kind of getting to that point where we could maybe agree to the two years, but they, they need that extra year to establish funding. So I was trying to get a, a compromise here because I'm seeing that we're not gonna agree on 18. And I'm seeing that maybe the 23 is probably because we're all agreeing on the 112. So I was just trying to get a compromise. Thank I you. Would, can, can you, would I thank do you. a time thing since we're past 10 o'clock just for our rules? Well, we have motions on the floor, so it's right. But we so. just want to let them make sure that we're going to continue beyond so that if there's someone waiting possibly for the next one and we're not going to do it. There's no one for okay. the next. Just no one for if the we're next. not going to do the next agenda item, it would be good to know before we, we wait, you know? Right. Thank you. There's no one for the next agenda item. Because I feel like we're getting close to like making a decision here. I would like to ask Councilor Wester about where he stands on this on this matter, if he doesn't mind answering. Okay. I believe that what CSO does is extremely important to the town. Um, I'm comfortable with the first year at the $112,000. I'm not really comfortable sending a second year to um, the town council that's gonna take over next year. Um, rather, I would rather leave that to their decision. Um, so I stand, uh, I, I support what Councilor McBride has put forward on a motion. Thank you. We also do not have Councillor Parker here. Is this a, um, a topic we should possibly wait for all councillors to be present? If you make that motion and, and, and it prevails. To uh, postpone till our next cow meeting. Mm -hmm. um, I'll make a motion to postpone to our next cow meeting. Which yeah. is, can you get the calendar? We'd have to vote. I do, I do believe we'd have to actually vote on this first one first, though, before I'm we make that motion. A postpone? Yeah, because we have three motions on the floor. Can you get out your rule book? Don't you already have a motion on the floor as well? I don't think postpone is um, oh. a motion. Mr. Mayor. Yes. Um, I, I think this is where we've reached a point where anything other than a decision is just, um, I think, a disrespect of each other's time and our guest time. Um, I think for the purposes of moving forward, um, the way that Councillor Kassiri explained things um, was uh, much clearer than how I had uh, initially uh, understood it. Um, and so if her desire is to make an allocation that would reflect two years as opposed to full 18. I think that actually brings it closer to what perhaps Councillor McBride or Councillor Borlon envision. With that said, um, would your motion literally mirror Councillor McBride's? Just the caveat. That Just the took. extra year, yes. With that said, I will withdraw my motion. I will withdraw my second. And should Councillor Kasseri make that motion, I'll second it. Thank you. I will make that motion to um, allocate the $112,907 for this year and whatever funds we receive for the next year uh, with the caveat that they have to come present to us before that allocation. Second, Joan? No, I second it. Oh, it's too late. <laughs> I appreciate that, Councilor Bumgarner. Um, motion by Councilor Kassiri, uh, $112,907, six cents year one and plus the year two allocation. Uh, motion by Council Kassiri, seconded by Councilor Bumgarner. Speaks for itself. <laughs> <laughs> Council Borla. Um, so I guess for the town manager, what if the amount is, I don't know, like, again, I, I have to think about every other process I mean, should it be a certain percent and then have them come before us? I mean, we don't know what the number's gonna be. We're, we're shooting in the dark here, which is just, I, I, again, it's nothing against the agency before me. I'm asked to do a task here and I'm, I'm voting on a, a random number that we don't know. We might, we, might not, we might get $5 and we might get 500, we might get a thousand. I'm just, I'm going way out there, but if the second amount is indicative to the first amount, what if the second amount's not enough? 
We don't know. It could all get freeze for two years. We, we don't know, right? We don't know. The rollout on anything is unknown. So I'm concerned about allocating 112, sorry, this mess. I'm sorry about, I'm, I'm, I'm sure about allocating $112,000 if it's indicative to having to have that second year. I have seen these things stall out and say, there's a freeze, you know, we're not gonna be allocating it for another three years because this new thing came forward and we're not gonna be allocating. Then what would you, well, then what would happen? If you needed that second allocation, if it doesn't come through, then what? Or if the number's so low that it doesn't make a difference? No, I, I think- I'm we, just asking fiscally responsible questions. Like I said, regardless, if you guys voted tonight to give us a second, we were, we're, gonna, we're gonna make our, we're gonna expand with that, the first set of money. Uh, and we take whatever came the second year. Uh, again, we, we don't know what it's going to be, but the, our jump, but our jumping off point, right? Now, again, for us to make the, for us to make that leap and, and know that the council's with us, I think that that helps. And, and knowing again, we're going to be in front of the council next year, and if we're explaining how we're still in the same office and we really haven't reached any more people, the next council is going to say, n not buying it. Uh, hopefully, they're going to be enjoying or getting to see our ribbon cutting. <laughs> At our next one, but we are we are going to do it. Um, you know, especially with this this first this this round of funding, uh, this is where we start making our plans. And so, so the original motion that was put on by Councillor McBride would still satisfy even without the second year because we don't know what the second year is going to do anyway. Well, so. um, I, th I think that in response we talked about having that that money in, in advance. And again, we know it's we know we still have to come and talk about it. But I think if you pass it in a way where the second the next council comes in. And they say, okay, why did they, why did they give you this money? And, and it's all gonna be based on this, this discussion, not just tonight, but what you guys have seen, what we've done over the last seven years. Uh, I think it just helps the next council in a way. It doesn't tie the hands, but it's gonna let them know that, that you know, nine members of the community stood up, nine counselors, and said that we think that we can do this. And the reason why, uh, that I like to explain to the next council of why you did it, was because you saw our two-year plan. Um, and again, like we wouldn't just take the 112,000 and do nothing with it this year. We're going to expand in some way, some form, some manner. Um, would the building not be as big? Would it not meet all of our needs that we're, that we're thinking of? Probably. Um, and that's what we're thinking with the second year behind it. And again, not guaranteed, but nothing really in life is really truly guaranteed. I mean, we have, we have to do the work on our side uh, and that's going to be done, but it will, it will matter what size building we look at, how many folks we're looking to reach out to. So that's, and yeah, just the other thing is, is it's a lawsuit money. It's it's not a grant. So uh, I'm assuming that the the way lawsuit money works is that it it's allocated to you in a certain way every year. So I, I I'm anticipating not that we're definitely believing it, but I hear you saying words like stall out. That would be something that would be a grant. Um, this is this is a lawsuit unless I'm I'm not knowledgeable on it. Well, anything can happen with a lawsuit. Fair. Like for yep. example, I've seen like uh, friends that got lawsuits from surgical um, things, like, and then it stalled out because a new thing came in. It got back brought back to court, and it came, but maybe later it didn't come annually. I mean, I guess I'll ask John: Is it stating that we're definitely getting a settlement next year? Yes, they've 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 got it planned out. There's going to be probably a little more next year, um, you know? because they've just come to an agreement with Walgreens, CVS, and Walmart. So it's expected to go up a bit next year. Did they predict how much? Not yet. They have, they haven't allocated yet. But so, it is these these amounts coming through now. Of course, the uh, manufacturer payment is kind of a sped up payment. They're front loading it for a few years. So you know that one will drop off before the distributor one does, but for a few years it's going to be pretty consistent. Other than like I said, it's going to pop up a bit. So we're expecting it somewhere more than 112. A bit, yeah. I don't. It's being a uh, still distributor payments. I don't anticipate a lot. Um, the manufacturing is the big one, but the distributor one will probably be more like that 23,000 type of thing. But we'll see how much comes in. I don't anticipate it being huge. So I guess for clarification, if these come in two payments, when we say the second year we're allocating both or one or which one? Well, my guess, well, right now you're saying both. Right, because um, it's not, I'm not, like this is what I'm saying. Yeah. I feel that we're just like rushing in my mind. I just, it's again, the agenda item and no offense to you guys doesn't state where we're, we're gonna be voting on money that we didn't know about. And that's new information that was not in the packet that 
It would come in at a higher rate. Are we talking about taupe two amounts now? So that would be great to know. Like, you know what I mean? Like, there's some yeah. things we're not talking about here. And if it was to come in more, I mean, so that we can bring some other agency around the table that you guys also utilize to support your agency, would 50% of those two new allocations that are going to come in higher be enough? And then if you guys came back and then asked for the other 50% if no one else kind of applies for them. I mean, is that doable? I mean, I feel like we need to make sure we're giving everyone a fair shot at the table. That's just what my heart tells me, my mind. So let's 112 plus a 20. John's predicting that it's going to come in more than 130,000. So if we said we give you the full 112 and 50% of the second year with the possibility of the other 50% when you guys come back before us, would that work? Well, no, I, I think I think like we said, the first the first year we would have stuck with and, and still expanded. But when we when we're talking about building size, and I think what seems like a big rush tonight, uh, and a vote for tonight, like we, we we'll make a decision on what we look for tomorrow, uh, in in the size and the space, and and again, I think if we stretch it out to two years, uh, for us that means that we have, and again, it doesn't lock us into what we can get. We understand another council is going to do it. So I think the, the argument for argument's sake. You're, you're going to pass it for two years, and the only teeth in it are none. First of all, just the only the only the only pull for the next council is that you guys kind of gave us your word a little bit that you were going to support us. But again, if the next we sit in front of the next council and they look at us and say, you know, we really don't agree with your project. We don't we don't think we don't think you lived up to the last intentions of the last council. So really, we're not talking about distributing two years of money. We're talking about distributing one in a lot of different ways. Uh, and I get what you're saying, and this is all. These are all just words at this point, because uh, the, the first year money is the only money that's going to hit the account and make us make a decision. The second year is going to be where we say, OK, we talk to the next council, but we're going to be able to hopefully tonight say nine other counselors from a previous council supported us in this way. Um, and I know, again, it, as much and, and it helps us provide a strategic plan. So when we sit down next year, we say, even though we're coming in front of you and we're saying we we're hoping that you give us the 112 again. Here's our strategic plan of what we're planning on doing with that money. And if it came in higher and we said, you know what, we're doing well, we're self-supportive, uh, we're, we're not going to just ask for money that we don't need either. This is, that's not our, that's not our, again, we, we know how to, we know how to spend it really fast uh, to get it to the people that need it. That, that's, that's the easy part, spending it. Um, but when we, when we set up systems, if you could be on the other line when you hear Tammy and Linda talking and these people sound so desperate and then they call the owner of the so sober house and talk to the owner for about a half hour and they say, well, they just got their income tax check. I don't know why they're calling you. Like every dime is dug down and, and looked at, like almost like you were handling your own budget and your own checkbook. That's the way this board handles money. I assure you, it doesn't, it doesn't leave their hands very easily. They have the checkbook. Um, and we're, st we're still able to help people, too. Because we want to help the next person. Exactly. Well, I definitely, my remarks don't discredit the work that you guys do in digging down in the books. Mine is just you know, uh, making sure I'm asking the questions, uh, because our vote, we have to answer to. And I 100% support it. Um, I just don't know. I just think it's Counselor's responsible time is expired. to have the agency come before us each year and, and discuss it. That's all. And, and we you. plan on doing that. Thank you. Councilor McBride. Thank you. I'm still struggling with providing a second year funding because I, one, I never heard of it before we appropriate money and, and beyond our years. But I'm just wondering if, I guess my question is now, now we're talking about a 250, 275, $300,000 outlay, which forget about every all the great work you do, just think of the number. Now I'm thinking, should this council have a little bit more information to review that $300,000 proposal, such as, per, you know, you talked about the renting the space and it costs so much money. And, you know, now I'm looking at it, should this be a project that we could look at in three weeks and you come back and say, if we get 112, we do this. If we get 300, we're going to do this. And that is renting the space or, you know, whatever it is. It just seems like now I feel like I, because I appreciate everything you do and I, I want to vote for it. I just have a hard time now voting for 300,000 when I, I really don't know what the plan is. I mean, I, I understand what, somewhat the plan is, but I, but three hundred thousand dollars is a big nut. So I don't, you know, I feel like now I feel like I need more information. In in I the world of addiction, of in in the world, I'm sorry, in the world of addiction, this is not a lot of money. A thousand dollars a day for one person to go to treatment for twenty eight hundred dollars for say if they go for twenty eight days, twenty eight thousand dollars. So 
we have, on our small income that we have, the amount of money that we have raised, have to spread that money out and help every individual that we can. Our goal from the from the day one was to try to stay in Groton because we've had so much support in Groton. We have opportunities going down the road. There's a justice center that's gonna open up in Waterford. Do we partner with them and leave the town of Groton? I don't want to leave the town of Groton. Our town is sick. Do we help surrounding towns? Yeah, we do. But we've had so much support here. And I'm asking for the support of the council right now. And if we don't have at least a couple years to know, I can't, we can't make those, the visions that we have and the dreams that we have of trying to make something bigger. And when I talk about a bigger office, we are outgrowing our office. We had a, people that were like this in our, in our rooms trying to do a Narcan training. We're talking about having a space that's on the bus line so people can actually physically get to us. This is for the betterment of Groton. So this investment you're making really is, like he said, it's, it was a lawsuit that is supposed to go directly for the abatement of the opioid crisis. We are doing every single thing. We are encompassing that whole entire lawsuit. Where else do you wanna bring it? You want, where else do you wanna put it? Have you guys, you knew the money was coming and I'm not trying to be rude. I'm really not trying to be rude. You knew the money was being allocated. You didn't know what it was going to be. You knew there was a lawsuit that was coming down the pike, right? So what have you done to find out what other organizations are where you think that that 100,000, you're gonna get the best bang for your, month, uh, your buck? Fiscal responsibility is to make sure that that $112,000 is gonna go far, not gonna pay for some salary and benefits. It's gonna go right to the people that need it. And that's what I'm asking for tonight. And I, and I, think, I'm, I think I understand what Councillor McBride is saying. You wanna stop point, right? You wanna, if, if it comes in next year, $300,000, you think that's a, lot, that's a lot of money to, to give to us. And, and maybe it's so, not a stop right, point. Maybe right, it continues for the 18 right. years. Right, yeah. exactly. I understand. So, can you make a vote that it's 120 or 112 thousand dollars, and then it would be a matching program the next year? And if it comes, if you get 400 thousand dollars, then you make an adjustment to whatever that is or what you want to do. So we have at least a starting point so that we're able to figure out what our strategic plan is going to be when we make our budget for the next year. When we come in front of you, that we're able to have it, not. We're going to have a plan, but we didn't know how much money it was, so we wouldn't, couldn't come up with a, a full plan for you. That's what we're trying to say. I, I understand. I guess going back in this, to this council package, we received a, a, a one-page piece of information that says we're going to discuss how to allocate the funds in future funds, and it's 123000 112. Now we're talking two, 250 or whatever the number is, double at 250. So I feel like a lot has changed, but and we've talked a lot, but... I, as a counselor, haven't reviewed information on what those plans are. We're talking about it, but you, you all know. You, when you, you want to review the documents to make sure you know what that 275 or more, or more is going to be. That's all. I'm not opposed to anything you're doing. I just feel like it's. I feel like we're, we're rushing a little bit at this I, at this stage of the game. And and I and I say that with all respect. I I do know this. I know that. In New London, I know what the costs are. I'm on several commissions. I know what the costs are every single time the EMTs go out. I know what the costs are when the when the uh, police need to respond to things. We're saving you money. Uh, CSO is saving you money in Groton by responding to things that you're not able to to prevent your your EMS, your emergency services, um, making sure that your sober homes are using best practices, that is all saving you money, more than $250,000. And we've been doing that for seven years. Yeah, and I'm not disputing any of the work you do. I appreciate everything you do. I just, I, the way this is being handled tonight, I feel like it's changed direction to what the original scope was this evening. And, in 18 years was on it. You know, it just seems like that, that changed a lot more than what I was expecting. I, I'm fully in support of what you what I you would did. just say where we are now, though, before we, get, before we get on a tangent, where we are now is two years with one only really being technically guaranteed. Right. That's true. That's technically where we are. All we're asking, uh, and, what, and I think it's important. I'm not saying it's, it's an easy vote for you because, you know, in the newspaper tomorrow, they're going to say, oh, my God, they gave away blah, blah, blah. Because I understand how the newspaper works. But the reality is you really only allocated money for one year. 
and a group came before you, and I think with a pretty good plan, we didn't have, we didn't hire an architect and do all those things. That that is not the kind of money that this group has. We're talking about getting a building. When, when we renovate it, it's going to be volunteers and hands-on and people that are in recovery. That's how our whole system works. So uh, when we're talking about the 112,000, I want to make sure we all realize that we're talking about the money for this year only. Uh, and when you do vote and allocate it to us for next year, it's really not our money. It's not in our hand. But I would like to have that advantage. I think it's an advantage that a, that a previous council had this long discussion on a night in February about what our plan was. And we still have to come back and show them how, what we did next year, how we executed it. Um, and it, we, we, could, we could have walked away and said, yeah, we'll just take the one year and then we'll, we'll, next year we'll come back and beg. We wanted to make sure that, again, you guys have already sound like that we made the commitment for one year. You're not really making a commitment for two, other than saying that you're supportive, you understand what our mission is right now. And the mission is to get this two-year strategic plan. Uh, and again, next year, if we show up and nothing was done, and, and then we have to come in front of a council and we're in the same building, and we have the same well, statistics. Let's I mean, be clear, when you're looking for a building, it doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't, no. So it could take us yeah, a yeah. good year to even find a building in Groton that's going to allow us, as we know the stigma of addiction, allow us to be in a building in the right area um, that people will accept us in. So it's gonna take some time. Um, but in the meantime, we are gonna be offering more to the schools because prevention is huge. And we're talking connection, connectivity, not just PowerPoints. Not, and I'm not disregarding PowerPoints, but kids now need real connection. We, tr we are really big on the prevention end of it. We are very big on, you talk, talk about children a lot today, we have a support group for kids. Those kids are impacted. They're being raised by grandparents because their mothers are dead. We are doing the work. We have parents now that, are, that don't have their kids. And we're sitting here taking our time to do a grief group. And if we're gonna continue, we need to know that our own town is behind us. I mean, I, can, I left my job not making any money anymore because I believe that we need to save people's lives. So if our own town can't back us up, I don't know how we can continue to sustain this. This is how passionate we are about Groton. When my son got addicted and I found out 40 kids that he knew were addicted already, and he sat, she just said, as we pulled in, the first time I ever met was at this council meeting, and I met Joey talking here in front of a council about he's struggling addiction, speaking out bravely. He's no longer here, so what is my fight? My fight is so that not another parent has to be alone in this journey because there's plenty of them out there. And if any one of you, any one of you has a child that is going to be suffering, it's gonna be us they're gonna call if you're in Groton or in other, other towns because we're out there. 211, what do I do? Call Community Speaks Out. We got a call from Southington last week, which is way outside of our realm. <laughs> and we don't encourage those, but we are on the 211 system. Um, and we, and we, we 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 have been able to help. We actually connected. So, I, who did I call? Kathy Zoll, because Kathy Zoll and those people in Southington, uh, another another connectivity. But I, again, I don't want to go on a tangent. I think I think if we we stay on point on where we are, I think we're very very close. Um, and you know, if, if the concern is the second year, I mean, again, we'll be back here next year. I I would like the commitment though. I think it's a good. Just want you to know, we're not going to have hundred thousand, hundred twelve thousand dollars is going to help us help people, but it's not going to help us expand the way we want to expand. So that's what it comes down to. And I think we need to save more lives than we're doing right now. And I think we see that every day when we look at the obituaries. Died unexpectedly, twenty-four years old. John, my understanding is that there's numerous more lawsuits than these. Do you have any information on the additional lawsuits and the potential other funds? Because my understanding is I'm hoping that we'll receive more money well before next year. Do you have any knowledge of that, or is, do any of you have that? Because that's what I've heard. Like every three or four months, there's going to be more money coming available. Nothing since this recent thing with uh, Walgreens and, and the others. I've heard of anything else anytime Just soon. I'm sure there'll be some others, but those, I, I think we're we'll probably getting into some of the smaller ones after this. Because there's like eight or nine lawsuits, right? Isn't there a bunch of them? 
Okay, thank you. Councilor Franco. Thank you. I understand what some councilors are saying here. They're saying, well, what happens if you get more than 112,000? I, I, I honestly don't know where the 300,000 came from, but what if you get more than 112? All right, so let's just say it comes in at 125. Are we really gonna nitpick and say, all right, you're only committed to 112 and anything over that, we're gonna figure out if we wanna give it to somebody else? I mean, I think you know how to spend this money very wisely on the people in our community who need it the most. And it's not like if it came in less, we're gonna make up the money. I mean, you're gonna get, it's just what it is, it is. I mean, have faith. I mean, these people are doing like an enormous amount of work as volunteers in our community and they have made an impact. I think from my perspective and what I've seen you do, it is a huge impact. Um, you are very well known and very respected within our community for what you do. And I thank you deeply. And I hope um, if, two, if I can get you two years with my vote, great. To be honest with you, I think you deserve all 18 years. I don't think you should have to beg for it the way you are. I think it's sort of sad that, to, that we're not just saying, you know what, you've earned it. You've earned getting this money for what you do in our community, because I truly believe you have. So I thank you for everything that you've done for us in our community, and I will support too, begrudgingly, because I want you to have all 18. Even knowing somebody in the future could change it, it's the statement to say, I support you and the people in our community and um, them getting the services they need. Thank you. Council Borlaug. Um, thank you. Um, thank you for your guys' uh, response and, and your, your, your testament. You know, I don't feel you're begging for the money. I, I mean, I feel, unfortunately, it's not your fault you didn't write the agenda. In my opinion, the, what the write-up here, I don't know if you guys, have you guys seen the write-up? Yes, it's public knowledge. Yeah, it's, it says, you know, I don't feel prepared to, to address the other funds. It wasn't on here. It just wasn't on here as an option. So I didn't have time to do, you know, research. It says we would discuss the methods of allocation. It didn't say we would be allocating tonight. The methods of allocating. What were those methods? I thought we would be brainstorming, figuring out, you know, you know that information that the town manager said that they may come in more. Okay, maybe we do want to consider a 10,000 pot at human services and if our human service director doesn't want to handle it, maybe there's $10,000 worth of Narcan to hand out or some other ways of having some outreach in our town, um, in our community. You know, there's other things that we could be doing at the human service level that address uh, addiction as well. Um, homelessness is a part of addiction. Um, food insecurity, um, you know, the families who deal with it, um, children who were raised and now are adults that have dealt with addiction their whole life. Um, what I'm saying is, is that I, this, the way this is written, it doesn't state what we're exactly doing as far as that goes. And so that's why I don't feel comfortable because there's been things up here where people said we're not following the agenda to the fullest or the thing. That's why I asked the question. So I wouldn't take it offensively. I don't think having to come back, it's being fiscally responsible. You're not going to have to beg for it. If you guys are putting in the work, it speaks for itself. I, I, I don't think you're going to have trouble. I don't think, I know that I probably won't vote down when it comes, if I'm back up here, I'm going to vote for it. It's not a problem. You know what I mean? If, if, if you guys come, but I think it's a, it's a pause and a stop and a reset to relook at, there's no plan here. We have one sheet. You know, we have no, no, nothing saying, you know, other things that we voted on were like, okay, give us a list exactly what the plans are. We haven't been given any of that. So if we're going to stand beyond that, uh, how many square feet are you guys looking for? What is the vision of what's going to be in the building? You know, these are things that other agencies are asked to bring before us. I would have asked for that in an email prior to, but it says we we're going to talk about how we could possibly discuss. So I apologize. Um, it's, it is the way it's written. As you saw the other agendas before us tonight, we did nothing with those because things weren't properly, in my opinion, I'll speak for myself, weren't on there. Again, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a matter of this is the way it's written. So I think the 112 gets the ball moving. And you know if we need to all say a consensus saying we would support next year as a council, we can do that because it's gonna, the number could change anyway. So I don't, don't look at it as, for, for me, I'll speak for myself, it's not that I don't support. I'm the biggest probably open cheerleader up here for outside agencies and support as my, my record goes. I just wanna make sure I'm operating within the means and, the, and this agenda item doesn't state that. So know that I'm 100% behind you, 
So I just, time has yeah. expired. Thank you. And I'm going to have to vote my conscience. Seeing no other hands, I'll call for a vote. Uh, point of information. Can you just uh, go over the list one more time since there was the amendment? Just about to do it. Thank you. First, we'll be voting on Councilor Kasiri's motion, uh, which is the $112,907.06 in year one and the year two allocation. Um, if that fails, after that, we will be voting on Councilor McBride's motion, first year allocation only. If that fails, we will be moving on to Councilor Franco's motion, which is the 18-year um, allocation. Okay. So first, to your allocation, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. aye. Abstentions? Okay. So that carries uh, six in favor, two opposed. Uh, Borlan, McBride, zero abstaining. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. Second. Uh, uh, oh, oh. It's not debatable. Second. Okay. Motion to adjourn by Councillor Franco, seconded by Councillor Casiri. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. <laughs> Abstentions? Okay. Six in favor, two opposed, one is Bumgarner, zero abstaining. We are adjourned at 1119.